Eight years after Joseph Smith's death, Brigham invented new doctrine to support a new policy that worthy black men were no longer allowed to receive the priesthood. This presentation addresses the origin of the priesthood race ban, why it lasted so long after Brigham's death, and how our second president led the church astray for 126 years. Joseph and Brigham's teachings were mirror opposites regarding racial equality, the morality of slavery, scriptural precedent, and equal access to the priesthood. Joseph taught that blacks and whites are intrinsically equal, while Brigham taught that blacks are inferior to whites. Joseph was morally opposed to slavery, and in 1844 proposed the sale of federal lands to compensate slave owners and end slavery. Brigham, on the other hand, was in favor of slavery and in 1852 pushed the Utah Territorial Legislature to legalize slavery five years after the saint's arrival in Utah. Joseph published the Book of Mormon, which teaches, quote, The Lord denieth none that come unto him, black and white, bond and free, and all are alike unto God. While Brigham claimed the Old Testament taught that blacks were descendants of Cain, whose rightful place was in servitude to whites, as blacks were unable to rule themselves. During Joseph's life, blacks received the priesthood and were invited to participate in temple activities, while eight years after Joseph's death, Brigham formally banned blacks from the priesthood and later prohibited black men and women from participating in temple ordinances. On racial equality, referring to blacks, Joseph taught that, quote, they came into the world slaves mentally and physically, change their situation with the whites and they would be like them, go into Cincinnati or any city and find an educated Negro who rides in his carriage and you will see a man who has risen by the powers of his own mind to his exalted state of respectability. The slaves in Washington are more refined than the presidents and the black boys will take the shine off many of those they brush and wait on. To take the shine off something means to make it seem less perfect or less good. In contrast, Brigham taught, quote, You see some classes of the human family that are black, uncouth, uncomely, disagreeable, and low in their habits, wild and seemingly deprived of nearly all the blessings of intelligence that is generally bestowed upon mankind. In contrast, Brigham taught, quote, You see some classes of the human family that are black, uncouth, uncomely, disagreeable, and low in their habits, wild, and seemingly deprived of nearly all the blessings of the intelligence that is generally bestowed upon mankind. And do we oppose the principle of servitude? I oppose it not in my judgment. In the providences of God, their ability is such that they cannot rise above the position of a servant. In a speech to Utah's territorial legislature in 1852, Brigham explained his views this way, quote, Thus, while servitude may and should exist, and by servitude in this context he means slavery, and that too upon those who are naturally designed to occupy the position of servant of servants, yet we should not fall into the other extreme and make them as beasts of the field, regarding not the humanity which attaches to the colored race, nor yet elevate them, as some seem disposed, to an equality with those whom nature and nature's God has indicated to be their masters, their superiors. Joseph was one of those who, in Brigham's terms, was disposed to elevate blacks to an equality with whites. Other than their shared view against interracial marriage, Joseph and Brigham's views on racial equality were diametrically opposed. Church policy while Joseph was alive was consistent with teachings in the scriptures he revealed. For example, quote, The Lord esteemeth all flesh in one. He that is righteous is favored of God. That all men are privileged, the one like unto the other, and none are forbidden. The Lord denieth none that come unto him, black and white, bond and free, male and female. And he remembereth the heathen, and all are alike unto God, both Jew and Gentile. And therefore it is not right that any man should be in bondage one to another. In contrast, Brigham claimed biblical support for his views while making up scriptural-sounding dialogue that doesn't appear in any book of scripture. Specifically, he taught, quote, Inasmuch as we believe in the Bible, inasmuch as we believe in the ordinances of God, in the priesthood and order and decrees of God, we must believe in slavery. When the Lord God cursed old Cain, he said, Until the last drop of Abel's blood receives the priesthood and enjoys the blessings of the same, Cain shall bear the curse. I am firm in the belief that they ought to dwell in servitude. To be practically clear, the dialogue I just read, supposedly from the mouth of God, was something Brigham made up. It doesn't appear anywhere in the scriptures. Let's read what the Bible actually says about God's curse on Cain because it doesn't mention anything about access to the priesthood. In Genesis chapter 4, we read, starting in verse 9, quote, And the Lord said unto Cain, 
Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which has opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. The Bible's clear that the Lord's curse on Cain was agricultural. When Cain tilled the ground to grow food, the earth wouldn't yield its strength in the production of crops. Priesthood isn't mentioned at all, continuing with Genesis 4. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid. And I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that every one that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken upon him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. The mark set on Cain by the Lord, which is not identified in the Bible, was for his protection. Interestingly, two years later, Brigham declared to the saints, quote, I have not read the Bible for many years. I used to be a Bible student. I used to read and study it, but did not understand the spirit and meaning of it. I knew well enough how it read. Not only had Brigham not read the Bible in many years, when he did read it, he didn't understand it, but somehow concluded that he already knew what it contained. This disclosure by Brigham is shocking. So we had to ask ourselves, was this the only time Brigham invented fake scriptural support for his teachings? Thankfully, Brigham addressed that question himself. In the same talk we just cited, here quoted at length, in the October Conference of 1854 in the Tabernacle in Salt Lake, Brigham explained, quote, I think these preliminaries will satisfy me, and I feel prepared to take my text. It is the words of Jesus Christ, but where they are in the Bible, I cannot tell you now, for I have not taken pains to look at them. I have had so much to do that I have not read the Bible for many years. I used to be a Bible student. I used to read and study it, but did not understand the spirit and meaning of it. I knew well enough how it read. My clerks know how much time I have to read. It is difficult for me to snatch time enough even to eat my breakfast and supper, to say nothing of reading. I feel inclined here to make a little scripture. Were I under the necessity of making scripture extensively, I should get Brother Heber C. Kimball to make it, and then I would quote it. As a reminder, Heber C. Kimball was Brigham's first counselor in the First Presidency, continuing with the quote, I have seen him do this when any of the elders have been pressed by their opponents and were a little at a loss. He would make a scripture for them to suit the case that never was in the Bible, though nonetheless true, and make their opponents swallow it as the words of an apostle or one of the prophets. The elder would then say, Please turn to that scripture, gentlemen, and read it for yourselves. No, they could not turn to it, but they could recollect it like the devil for fear of being caught. End quote. By his own admission, Brigham had no problem inventing scriptures to back up his teachings, and that's exactly what he did to justify the introduction of his priesthood ban. Lest you think that Brigham was joking or being self-effacing about not having read the Bible for years and not having understood it when he did have time to read it, Consider this statement from Brigham in 1852, quote, Again, after Adam and Eve had partook of the curse, we find they had two sons, Cain and Abel, but which was the oldest I cannot positively say. It's literally in the fourth chapter of the book of Genesis that we read that Eve, quote, conceived and bare Cain, and then in the next verse that, and she again bare his brother Abel. If one were to read the Bible from cover to cover, this is the fourth chapter they would encounter. Brigham really didn't know the scriptures, but more importantly, didn't seem to care. From his perspective, as long as people believed what he taught, what was the need? As far as the scriptures are concerned, some people claim that the Book of Mormon, published by Joseph Smith before the church was organized, is racist because it teaches that, quote, the skins of the Lamanites were dark according to the mark which was set upon their fathers, which was a curse upon them because of their transgressions and rebellion against their brethren, end quote. But the Book of Mormon's teachings are clearly egalitarian while the book's plot culminates in a decidedly anti-white finale. Nephi is clear about how the heavens view race, quote, The Lord esteemeth all flesh in one. He that is righteous is favored of God. And later on, All men are privileged, the one like unto the other, and none are forbidden. The Lord denieth none that come unto him, black and white, bond and free, male and female. And he remembereth the heathen, and all are alike unto God. Towards the end of the Book of Mormon's thousand-year history, the white Nephite civilization is completely annihilated by the Lord due to their wickedness. As Moroni explains, Great and marvelous is the destruction of my people, the Nephites, and behold, it is the hand of the Lord which hath done it.
In the Book of Mormon, Jesus himself explains that the dark-skinned Latter-day Lamanite descendants, whom the Lord refers to as his people, are the ones to whom Jesus has given, by covenant, the North American continent as their own, and that, spoiler, they'll eventually tread down and tear in pieces the white Gentiles of the latter days, with only a small white remnant surviving to assist, not be in charge, but assist the descendants of the Lamanites to build Zion. In other words, the tables will absolutely turn. That's the overall race message of the Book of Mormon. Jesus said, quote, And my people, who are a remnant of Jacob, shall be among the Gentiles, yea, in the midst of them as a lion among the beasts of the forest, as a young lion among the flocks of sheep, who, if he go through, both treadeth down and teareth in pieces, and none can deliver. Yea, woe be unto the Gentiles, except they repent. But if they will repent and hearken unto my words, they shall come in unto the covenant, and be numbered among this the remnant of Jacob, unto whom I have given this land for their inheritance. And they shall assist my people, the remnant of Jacob, that they may build a city, which shall be called the New Jerusalem. The Book of Mormon's message on race is that every white group mentioned is ultimately destroyed by darker ones, and we're no exception. The overall race message of the Book of Mormon is anti-white. Joseph and Brigham also held opposite views on the morality of slavery. In 1842, the prophet Joseph advises that slaves owned by Mormons be brought, quote, into a free country and set free, educate them and give them equal rights. In 1843, he explained, had I anything to do with the Negro, I would put them on a national equalization. And in 1844, Joseph stated with some pride that in Nauvoo there was not a slave, quote, to raise his rusting fetters and chains and exclaim, O Liberty, where are thy charms? Ironically, some of the free black people and a number of others who later lived briefly in Nauvoo again appear to be slaves several years later in Utah under Brigham's governance. Brigham believed the opposite. In 1852, he said, Inasmuch as we believe in the Bible, inasmuch as we believe in the ordinances of God and the priesthood and order and decrees of God, we must believe in slavery. This colored race have been subjected to severe curses, which they have in their families, in their classes, and in their various capacities brought upon themselves. And until the curse is removed by him who places it upon them, they must suffer under its consequences. I am not authorized to remove it. I am a firm believer in slavery. When a master has a Negro and uses him well, he is much better off than if he was free. As for masters knocking them down and whipping them and breaking the limbs of their servants, I have as little opinion of that as any person can have. But good, wholesome servitude, I know there is nothing better than that. Brigham's use of the word servitude here is just a euphemism for slavery. Brigham, apparently, was a firm believer in good, wholesome slavery. When Brigham said we must believe in slavery, he was talking about the Latter-day Saints. If Brigham is to be trusted, Latter-day Saints must believe in slavery. When we compare the teachings of Joseph and Brigham on race-based access to the priesthood, the differences are stark and irreconcilable. Their teachings were diametrically opposed, and Brigham made up new doctrine to justify his priesthood ban. Most importantly, Brigham claimed the priesthood ban began with Cain. If that were true, Joseph's policy of allowing blacks to receive the priesthood was wrong. Either Joseph or Brigham had to be wrong about their beliefs and policies regarding access to the priesthood based on race. One of them necessarily led the church astray. Which of the two do you think actually understood the mind and will of God on the subject? The church attempts to bridge the insurmountable gap between Joseph and Brigham's teachings by positioning Brigham's race ban as a timing issue, as we can see twice in the same paragraph here in the church's race and the priesthood essay. Quote, church leaders pondered promises made by prophets such as Brigham Young that black members would one day receive priesthood and temple blessings. And below, the first presidency stated that they were aware of the promises made by the prophets and presidents of the church who have preceded us that all of our brethren who are worthy may receive the priesthood. The problem is that if we look at what Brigham actually said about his non-scriptural priesthood curse of Cain being lifted, he actually prophesied that it wouldn't be removed until after the earth had been redeemed and until after the resurrection of the dead, both of which are supposed to happen in the millennium. That means the 1978 revelation that all worthy men could receive the priesthood couldn't have been a fulfillment of Brigham's prophecy as it clearly happened before the millennium. For example, in 1852, Brigham taught that, quote, The Lord told Cain that he should not receive the blessings of the priesthood nor his seed until the last of the posterity of Abel had received the priesthood until the redemption of the earth. And then in 1854, he reinforced the teaching again when he taught, quote, When all the other children of Abel have the privilege of receiving the priesthood and of coming into the kingdom of God and of being redeemed from the four quarters of the earth and have received their resurrection from the dead, then it will be time enough to remove the curse from Cain and his posterity. 
Based on Brigham's own words, the difference between Joseph's teachings and Brigham's cannot be a timing issue. The issue is that Joseph and Brigham taught incompatible, mutually exclusive doctrines, and only one of them could have been correct. When Brigham announced the priesthood ban in 1852, he didn't claim revelation to justify the change, and he was clear that from his own perspective, it didn't matter if no prophet, like Joseph Smith, ever spoke it before. He knew that blacks, whom he referred to as descendants of Cain, could not bear rule in the priesthood. In Brigham's own words, quote, The Lord told Cain that he should not receive the blessings of the priesthood, nor his seed, until the last of the posterity of Abel had received the priesthood, until the redemption of the earth. If there never was a prophet or apostle of Jesus Christ spoke it before, I tell you, this people that are commonly called Negroes are the children of old Cain. I know they are. I know they cannot bear rule in the priesthood. And that's how the priesthood ban was formally born. During Brigham's efforts to legalize slavery in Utah, Apostle Orson Pratt addressed the legislature and strongly opposed Brigham's proposal. Orson called slavery a great evil, asserting that only God can dictate and administer divine curses, which shouldn't necessarily affect all future generations. Elder Pratt reminded all present that Brigham hadn't claimed any revelation on the matter when Orson asked, quote, Shall we take the innocent African that has committed no sin and damn him to slavery and bondage without receiving any authority from heaven to do so? Orson found the idea preposterous, claiming it made him feel indignant. To bind the African because he is different from us in color was enough, Orson claimed, to cause the angels in heaven to blush. Brigham countered Elder Pratt's opposition by reminding the legislators not to forget their obligation to the church, and thus to him as the church's president. He said, quote, But the principle that I have in my mind that I do want these gentlemen to realize, to be fully sensible of, is simply this, that when they meet here in a legislative capacity, not to forget that they are elders in Israel, apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, that they are saints of the Most High God, and I hope and pray that a feeling to the contrary of this may never arise in the bosom of any one of these men. If we were one as we were two years ago, or a year and a half ago when we met in a legislative capacity, a different spirit would be manifest. In contrast to Joseph's teachings that no power or influence can or ought to be maintained by virtue of the priesthood only by persuasion and long-suffering, we're reminded that church leaders that resort to position or supposed keys to exercise control or dominion or compulsion on others, even to drive alignment, lose any priesthood they might have had. Quote, Amen to the priesthood and authority of that man. The same day Brigham gave this talk, his bill was passed and slavery became legal in Utah for the first time. Brigham promoted an approach that made disagreement with the church's president apostasy, which nearly all the apostles accepted. While apostolic alignment produces by definition a type of organizational truth and can seem persuasive given member respect for the brethren, it can also imbue false doctrine with undeserved legitimacy. We should be aware of how, ironically, the practice of following the church president implicitly puts us at increased risk of mistaking error as truth. The apostolic consensus regarding Brigham's Adam-God doctrine provides an interesting example of this phenomenon. Brigham first taught Adam-God doctrine at General Conference in April of 1852. Young said he intended to discuss, quote, who it was that begat the son of the Virgin Mary, end quote, a subject which he said, quote, has remained a mystery in this kingdom up to this day, end quote. The transcript reads, quote, When our father Adam came into the Garden of Eden, he came into it with a celestial body and brought Eve, one of his wives, with him. He helped to make and organize this world. He is Michael, the archangel, the ancient of days, about whom holy men have written and spoken. He is our father and our God, and the only God with whom we have to do. Every man upon the earth, professing Christians or non-professing, must hear it and will know it sooner or later. In 1854, Brigham taught his Adam-God doctrine again, that Adam is literally our Heavenly Father in the tabernacle during October 1854 conference. Specifically, he taught that, quote, Adam is the father of our spirits. I tell you, when you see your father in the heavens, you will see Adam. When you see your mother that bear your spirit, you will see Mother Eve. One member recorded this about those conference teachings from Brigham, quote, There were some that did not believe the sayings of the prophet Brigham. Even our beloved brother Orson Pratt, that's Apostle Orson Pratt, the same one who opposed Brigham on slavery, told me that he did not believe it. He said he could prove by the scriptures it was not correct. I felt sorry to hear Professor Orson Pratt say that. I fear lest he should apostatize. Ultimately, Apostle Pratt was not the only one to recognize that the doctrine contradicted the scriptures and revelation given by the prophet Joseph. The resistance to Brigham's Adam-God doctrine seems to have continued throughout Brigham's life. In 1857, Brigham said in conference, 
Quote, some have grumbled because I believe our God to be so near to us as Father Adam. In 1873, in this excerpt from the Deseret News from a talk Brayman gave in the tabernacle, he said, quote, How pleased we would be to place these things before the people if they would receive them. How much unbelief exists in the middle of the Latter-day Saints in regard to one particular doctrine which I revealed to them, which God revealed to me, namely that Adam is our Father and God. End quote. This was a doctrine that Brigham tried to get members to believe in for over two decades. Note that Brigham in this quote claims that God revealed the doctrine to him. So this begs the question, as this doctrine is not discussed in the church today, what happened to Brigham's Adam-God doctrine? We hope that you who teach in the various organizations, whether in the campuses or in our chapels, will always teach the orthodox truth. We warn you against the dissemination of doctrines which are not according to the scriptures and which are alleged to have been taught by some of the general authorities of a past generation, such, for instance, as the Adam-God theory. We denounce that theory and hope that everyone will be cautioned against this and other kinds of false doctrine. In 1860, Brigham met with eight of the twelve apostles and the presiding bishop to address ongoing disagreement between Apostle Orson Pratt and himself over Brigham's Adam-God doctrine, which he had introduced eight years before. During the meeting, Orson claimed Brigham had, quote, preached and published that Adam is the father of our spirit and father of our bodies. When I read the revelations given to Joseph, I read directly the opposite. Brigham responded, quote, your statements tonight, you come out tonight and place them as charges and have as many against me as I have against you. One thing I have thought I might still have omitted. It was Joseph's doctrine that Adam was God when in Luke Johnson's. Joseph could not reveal what was revealed to him. If Joseph had it revealed, he was told not to reveal it. There is not a contradictory thing in what I have said. We need to pay close attention to Brigham's words here. To defend his novel doctrines, Brigham sometimes claimed a private conversation with Joseph, which no one could refute. Here he uses similar logic, except he claims that Joseph taught Adam-God doctrine at Luke Johnson's house, who was one of the original twelve apostles who had subsequently been dropped from the quorum for apostasy. Think about this. Elder Pratt had been openly criticizing Brigham's Adam-God doctrine for at least the last six years because it conflicted with Joseph's teachings. And now, in this meeting, with the majority of the Twelve convened specifically to deal with Orson's doctrinal criticism of President Young, Brigham suddenly remembers for the first time, and in contradiction to his claim that the doctrine had remained a mystery in the kingdom until the day he taught it, that it was actually Joseph who taught the doctrine first. But then Brigham changes his story and again contradicts himself by claiming that actually Joseph couldn't reveal what had been revealed to him. Brigham then calls into question everything he just claimed by trying to rationalize that the reason nobody had heard Joseph teach it must have been because if Joseph had had it revealed to him, he must have been told not to reveal it. He then concludes, ironically, by asserting that none of the clearly contradictory things he just said were contradictory. Even though no intervening dialogue from other participants in the meeting is noted during Brigham's response, I imagine Elder Pratt and or others in the meeting making gestures indicating confusion, if not disbelief at Brigham's mystifying chain of logically incompatible assertions, given Brigham's continuously evolving narrative. Let's read it one more time to fully appreciate Brigham's logic. Quote, one thing I have thought I might still have omitted, it was Joseph's doctrine that Adam was God when in Luke Johnson's. Joseph could not reveal what was revealed to him. If Joseph had it revealed, he was told not to reveal it. There is not a contradictory thing in what I have said. Most of the same meeting attendees reconvened the next morning to continue the discussion. For unspecified reasons, Brigham decided not to attend. The next morning, these seven apostles, elders Hyde, Woodruff, Snow, Rich, Pratt, Taylor, and Smith, met in the church historian's office to continue the discussion on the doctrinal conflict between Apostle Orson Pratt and President Brigham Young. What we'll see in this meeting is the rationale and justifications offered by the other apostles for supporting Brigham in his preaching of the Adam-God doctrine. Keep in mind that their arguments are in defense of what we now understand to be false doctrine, as we saw in the clip of President Kimball in General Conference. 
president of the Quorum of the Twelve, Orson Hyde, was the first to speak. He said, quote, I do not feel competent to take up the points of difficulty between, between Brother Pratt and Brother Young, but to acknowledge that this is the kingdom of God and that there is a presiding power, and to admit that he can advance incorrect doctrine is to lay the axe at the foot of the tree, or in other words, would be the beginning of the destruction of the church. Will he suffer his mouthpiece to go into error? No. He would remove him and place another there. Brother Brigham is responsible for the doctrine taught in this church, and if he did not watch us and reprove us when wrong, he is the presiding authority of God on the earth, then he is legitimate, and everything opposed to him is not legitimate. God is a jealous God, and his servants are jealous with a godly jealousy, that the stream may roll in purity. This is the earliest articulation of the doctrine that the church president can't lead the church astray that I've come across. While the mention of that doctrine is often associated with a talk President Wilfred Woodruff gave in conjunction with the issuance of the First Manifesto in 1890, this quote, uttered over 30 years before, could be the genesis of the concept. Because we know the end from the beginning and understand now, thanks to President Kimball's clarification, that the doctrine this argument supports is a falsehood, it reminds us very specifically that a church president absolutely can lead the church astray. Apostle Woodruff spoke next. He said, The remarks of Brother Hyde are dictated by the Spirit of Wisdom and the Spirit of the Lord. Our position is very responsible, and we could not aspire to anything greater. Having received the apostleship, we should try to honor it. When Brother Pat made his confession, it made me rejoice, because I thought it was the first time that he felt to fall into the channel. I would not do anything to lose my apostleship. I would rather lose my hand or my life. Brother Pratt ought to make the thing right with President Young. Given that Orson Hyde's remarks were in defense of false doctrine, the only way they could be considered wise is if the objective were short-term institutional unity and stability, in which case we'd probably have to agree with him. But if the objective is to identify truth, then we can't agree with Elder Woodruff that Elder Hyde's remarks were directed by the Spirit of Wisdom or the Spirit of the Lord. Apostle Charles C. Rich then added, quote, It has been sorrow to me that there has been any difficulty arisen between Brother Brigham and Brother Pratt. I feel very anxious on the subject. It is not right for a member to have a doctrine opposed to his quorum or the presidency. Ironically, if Elder Pratt was correct, and President Kimball certainly believed that he was, wouldn't disagreeing with his quorum have been the right thing for Elder Pratt to do? Elder Pratt responded, I do not see how I can mend the matter one way or the other. I think the brethren are laboring under a wrong impression. In all my writings on doctrine, I have tried to confine myself within revelation. In regard to Adam being our Father and our God, I have not published it, although I frankly say I have no confidence in it, although advanced by Brother Kimball in the stand, that's Heber C. Kimball, Brigham's first counselor in the First Presidency, and afterwards approved by Brother Brigham, I have never intended to advance new ideas but to keep within Revelation. It is said if Joseph would translate now, it would be so very different. If that was so, I should never know when I was right. In 14 years hence, all the Revelation of Brigham may be done away. The Lord deals with us on consistent principles. There may be apparent contradictions, but to suppose that the meaning would be different, I do not believe it. I do believe that Brother Brigham errs in judgment. Elder Pratt implies that someone had been teaching that if the Book of Mormon were to be retranslated again in 1860, that it would be so very different compared to Joseph's original translation. I assume Brigham is the one who was teaching it, because two years later that's exactly what Brigham taught. Quote, And I will even venture to say that if the Book of Mormon were now to be rewritten, in many instances it would materially differ from the present translation. End quote. It seems Brigham repeatedly tried to undermine the legitimacy of Joseph's teachings and revelations, and this was one of those times. Remember, Joseph claimed in 1841 that the Book of Mormon was the most correct of any book on earth and the keystone of our religion, and a man would get nearer to God by abiding by its precepts than any other book. And now, in 1860, Brigham is calling that into question. Brigham liked to describe himself as Joseph's most dedicated disciple when it benefited him. But as we observe Brigham's actual words, he repeatedly tried to diminish the trustworthiness of Joseph's revelations, including the Book of Mormon, Joseph's inspired translation of the Bible, the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price. For example, as I just mentioned, in 1841 the prophet Joseph taught, I told the brethren that the Book of Mormon was the most correct of any book on earth, whereas Brigham claimed in 1862 that if the Book of Mormon were now to be rewritten, in many instances it would materially differ from the present translation. 
Regarding Joseph's translation of the Bible, Joseph reinforced the importance of what we now refer to as the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible, or JST, when he taught in 1831, quote, said the Lord would cut his work short in righteousness and accept the church receive the fullness of the scriptures, which was the JST, they would yet fall. The Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints published in 1867 the Joseph Smith inspired translation of the Holy Scriptures and sent a copy to Brigham in Salt Lake City. Brigham asked Orson Pratt to evaluate the publication for possible future use in the church. Pratt apparently overstepped Brigham's expectations, however, when on two separate occasions Pratt publicly expressed his personal approval of the JST. Apostle Wilfred Woodruff wrote of the first occasion, which occurred in May of 1868 at a meeting of the Provost School of the Prophets, quote, Orson Pratt spoke upon the new translation of the Old and New Testament as translated by the prophet Joseph Smith before his death, and it had been published of late by the followers of young Joseph, and a copy had been sent to President Young, and it was published in its purity, and we felt much rejoiced that a copy had fallen into President Young's hands. Brother Pratt showed the difference between the Old and New Translation on the Second Coming of the Messiah. Three weeks later, Pratt addressed the same group of priesthood holders. This time, Brigham attended the session and, following Pratt's few remarks, quote, bore testimony in strong terms that Joseph did not finish the New Translation of the Old and New Testament, which young Joseph had lately published. Brigham's strategy to discredit Joseph's translation of the Bible implies that if Joseph didn't finish the entire translation, the contents can't be trusted. Fortunately, Joseph explicitly confirmed that he had finished his translation of the entire Bible. Brigham's claim is directly contradicted by two specific statements from Joseph. The first uh, comes from a July 1832 letter from Joseph to W.W. Phelps in which he wrote, quote, We have finished the translation of the New Testament. The second comes from a letter written on July 2, 1833, from the First Presidency, including Joseph Smith, Sidney Rigdon, and Frederick G. Williams, in Kirtland, to the Saints in Zion, which recorded that, quote, This day finished the translating of the scriptures for which we return gratitude to our Heavenly Father. This is another clear instance of, as we've seen repeatedly before, Brigham manufacturing false claims, in this case that Joseph hadn't finished his inspired translation of the Bible. Brigham never published the JST. Regarding Joseph's revelations in the Doctrine and Covenants, Brigham said in 1860 that, quote, I told Brother Joseph he had given us revelation enough to last us 20 years. When that time is out, I can give as good revelation as there is in the Doctrine and Covenants. One time when Brigham, referring to Elder Orson Pratt, said, Maybe though he don't think I have revelation. If I don't, I don't magnify my calling. There are hundreds of this. I could write revelation as fast as dog trots. When I write and send forth my revelations, they are the revelations of eternity. I never look at my sermons. I don't cross my tracks. Given Brigham's claim that he could write revelations as fast as a dog trots, it's surprising that officially we have only one section from him in the DNC, section 136. Brigham never had the Pearl of Great Price published during his lifetime. In 1851, the original Pearl of Great Price was published as a missionary pamphlet by the mission president in Europe and included the Book of Abraham and part of the Book of Moses. The next edition, edited and arranged by Elder Orson Pratt, included the Book of Abraham and the full Book of Moses, but wasn't published until a year after Brigham died and was canonized a couple of years after that. And Joseph Smith's mother, Lucy Mack Smith, wrote a book about her son's life, which impressed Apostle Orson Pratt to the point he suggested, quote, if the schools of our territory would introduce this work as a reader, it would give the young and rising generation some knowledge of the facts and incidents connected with the opening of the grand dispensation of the last days. Brigham had very different feelings about the biography and directed members to destroy all copies of the book, as we can see in these newspaper clippings from the Deseret News in 1865. This epistle from the First Presidency reads, Hearken, O ye Latter-day Saints, and all ye inhabitants of the earth, who wish to be saints, to whom this writing shall come. Happening lately, while on a preaching trip to Cache Valley, to pick up a book which was lying on a table in the house where we were stopping, we were surprised to find that it was the book bearing the title on the outside of Joseph Smith the Prophet, and on the title page, Biographical Sketches of Joseph Smith the Prophet and His Progenitors for Many Generations by Lucy Smith, Mother of the Prophet. We now wish to publish our views and feelings respecting this book, so that they may be known to all the saints in all the world. 
In Great Britain, diligence has been used in collecting and in disposing of this work, and we wish the same diligence continued there and also exercised here, at home, until not a copy is left. The inquiry may arise in the minds of some persons, why do you want to destroy this book? Because we are acquainted with individual circumstances alluded to in it and know many of the statements to be false. We could go through the book and point out many false statements which it contains, but we do not feel to do so. It is sufficient to say that it is utterly unreliable as a history, as it contains many falsehoods and mistakes. In contrast, in 1969, BYU religion professor Richard L. Anderson came to the opposite conclusion about the historical accuracy of Joseph's biography written by his mother. He wrote, quote, Lucy Smith's memories of the early years of the rise of Mormonism have a demonstrable degree of accuracy. Brigham suggested that the original manuscript was stolen and altered, but the original manuscript was purloined, we suppose, from Mother Smith and went into the hands of apostates and was purchased of them by Orson Pratt. Brigham also asserted that it wasn't to be trusted because much of it was written after the death of Joseph and Lucy Mac Smith's memory was fading with age. Without entering into all the details of the writing of this book and its production in print, we may say that at the time it was written, which was after the death of the prophet Joseph, Mother Smith was 70 years old and very forgetful. Her mind had suffered many severe shocks through losing a beloved husband and four sons of exceeding promise to whom she was fondly attached, three of whom had but recently fallen victims to mobocratic violence, and she could therefore scarcely recollect anything correctly that had transpired. This is interesting logic because if we shouldn't trust things written about the prophet Joseph after he died, then we ought to be highly skeptical of the church's claims about Joseph's life in Nauvoo, as Joseph didn't review them before he was killed. One of the stated reasons Brigham wanted the book destroyed was because of its treatment of Joseph's brother William, who was an apostle in good standing at the time Joseph died. Brigham claimed, quote, those who have read the history of William Smith and who knew him know the statements made in that book respecting him when he came out of Missouri to be utterly false. It seems important to Brigham to discredit William. Twenty years before, William had publicly accused Brigham, John Taylor, and Heber C. Kimball of secretly introducing the corrupt doctrine and practice of spiritual wives into the church behind Joseph's back. In 1845, William privately published a proclamation which led to his excommunication which was subsequently published publicly in the Warsaw Signal, in which he said, quote, In noticing the claims of Brigham Young to superior power and authority, I would here observe that I heard my brother Joseph declare before his death that Brigham Young was a man whose passions, if unrestrained, were calculated to make him the most licentious man in the world. And should the time ever come, said he, that this man should lead the church, he would certainly lead it to destruction. What, my brethren, I would ask you, are the claims of Brigham to the keys of the church above the rest of the twelve? They are the keys which Joseph never conferred on Brigham Young, nor was power ever given to him to lead the church in his place as his successor. The church is hereby warned. As long as we're covering Brigham's attempts to diminish and discredit Joseph, it should include this from a special council meeting in Salt Lake in 1858, in which Brigham claimed that the reason Joseph Smith died was because he stopped following the Spirit at the end of his life. This is similar to the accusations that Joseph's enemies levied against him prior to his death of being a fallen prophet, which we know about because Joseph publicly disputed them. Brigham taught, quote, I will deviate from my subject a little and say a few words with regard to Brother Joseph that some perhaps have not understood. If Joseph Smith, Jr., the prophet, had followed the spirit of revelation in him, he never would have gone to Carthage. Do you understand that? Voices, yes. A great many do, and some do not. Many of the first elders of this church have a different understanding. Never for one moment did he say that he had one particle of light in him after he started back from Montrose to give himself up in Nauvoo. But if Joseph had followed the revelations in him, he would have been our earthly shepherd today. Brigham was over a thousand miles away on the East Coast when Joseph returned from Montrose, Iowa to Nauvoo several days before he was killed, and thus never saw or conversed with Joseph. Brigham cared so much about making this point known that he had this talk published as a pamphlet and distributed it. Attempts to position Brigham as a dedicated and faithful follower of Joseph ignore important evidence that Brigham attempted to discredit and diminish Joseph's revelations and actions as the founding leader of the church. 
It's interesting to note that on this point, as we've seen multiple times before, when teaching in a different place, Brigham completely contradicts himself on this accusation of Joseph dying because he didn't follow the Spirit. In the Church's Teachings of the Presence of the Church manual on Brigham Young in chapter 47, we read, quote, Though he had prophesied, talking about Joseph, that he would not live to be 40 years of age, yet we all cherished hopes that that would be a false prophecy and we should keep him forever with us. We thought our faith would outreach it, but we were mistaken. He at last fell a martyr to his religion. I said, it is all right. Now the testimony is in full force. He has sealed it with his blood. Brigham seems to have no problem making up whatever story about Joseph suited his needs at the moment. Okay, so getting back to the meeting where other apostles are trying to convince Elder Pratt to accept Brigham's Adam-God doctrine as truth, in response to Brigham's claim that the Book of Mormon would be translated differently now in 1860, Elder Pratt wisely identified that the revisionist interpretation of Joseph's revelations that Brigham was trying to promote would never allow the Church to find any stable doctrinal footing. It's not hard to see how Brigham's approach would have made members entirely dependent upon whatever Brigham decided was true. Like Elder Pratt said, if that was so, I should never know when I was right. In 14 years hence, all the revelations of Brigham may be done away. The Lord deals with us on consistent principles. John Taylor next interjected, When Brother Brigham tells me a thing, I receive it as a revelation. Some things may be apparently contradictory, but are not really contradictory. This is a mind game we sometimes play with ourselves when we don't want to deal with the implications of something being true that we don't want to be true. Oftentimes, things that appear to be contradictory are, and in this case, they were. Elder Pratt replied, I have heard Brother Brigham say that Adam is the father of our spirits, that he came here with his resurrected body to fall for his children. I heard Brother Young say that Jesus had a body, flesh and bones, before he came. He was born of the Virgin Mary. It was so contrary to every revelation given. As Pratt paused, Hyde turned to George A. Smith and said, Brother George A. Smith, just tell us what will be satisfactory to the church by which it seems he means what would be satisfactory to Brigham. Elder George A. Smith, grandfather of later church president George Albert Smith, and the man after whom the city of St. George in southern Utah is named, explained that the real issue was Pratt's unwillingness to unquestioningly accept whatever Brigham taught. Elder Smith positions the issue as binary. Either Brigham is inspired or not, and it is unacceptable to suggest that he is not, even in his Adam-God doctrine, which we now understand was false. George A. explained that what was required to satisfy Brigham was, quote, for him, meaning Orson Pratt, to acknowledge Brigham Young as president of the church in the exercise of his calling, but he only acknowledges him as a poor driveling fool. He, meaning Brigham, preaches doctrine opposed to Joseph and all other revelations. If Brigham Young is the president of the church, he is an inspired man. If we have not an inspired man, then Orson Pratt is right. The only thing is for Brother Pratt to get a revelation that Brother Brigham Young is a prophet of God. Implicit in George A.'s logic is that the president of the church cannot make a mistake, or in other words, that he is infallible. Elder Erastus Snow added, quote, I don't think any light can come to Brother Pratt while he resists it. Ironically, Elder Pratt is the only one who is able to perceive the light enough to recognize that Brigham's teachings were incorrect. Elder Pratt was willing to say he had made a mistake in teaching against Brigham, but not to admit that he had taught false doctrine when he had not. He said, quote, I did make a confession with my heart. I am only an individual. I cannot possibly yield to say I have published false doctrine. Next, Elder Woodruff offers an interesting non sequitur and then confesses that he would simply follow the church leader, quote, I have wondered why the Lord could not have cooked up something easier than to see the human family going to hell or to send his son to be crucified. I would follow the leader and do the best I could. John Taylor then tried to drive the conversation back to the core issue, which is whether or not the president of the church has the authority to unilaterally dictate doctrine. In his opinion, the answer has to be that he does, or there's no reason for the church. Quote, I don't like any patching, but follow the dictates of our presidency. I don't believe in having things thrown out on Brother Brigham. If that mouthpiece has not power to dictate, I would throw all Mormonism away we can see that all of the arguments offered by the apostles, with the exception of Elder Pratt, are the same arguments offered today to support the church president when problematic teachings are introduced. What's important for us to recognize is that, just like they were falsely invoked to support Brigham's teachings of the false Adam-God doctrine in 1860, they are no guarantee to us today that the church's president can't lead church members astray.
It's interesting to note that although Brigham's Adam God doctrine was taught as part of the lecture at the Vale in the St. George Temple after Brigham's death, Adam God doctrine seems to have ceased to be preached from the pulpit after Brigham died. It was almost as if none of the brethren that surrounded Brigham really believed it, but they had to support it while he was alive to maintain the facade of the Lord not allowing the president to lead the church astray. Apostle George Q. Cannon, who had been one of Brigham's counselors, revealed this about how some of the apostles felt about Brigham, which they were only willing to share after he had passed away. Quote, Some of my brethren, as I have learned since the death of President Brigham Young, did have feelings concerning his course. They did not approve of it and felt oppressed, and yet they dared not exhibit their feelings to him. He ruled with so strong and stiff a hand, and they felt that it would be of no use. In a few words, the feeling seems to be that he transcended the bounds of the authority which he legitimately held. I have been greatly surprised to find so much dissatisfaction in such quarters. Some even feel that in the promulgation of doctrine, he took liberties beyond those to which he was legitimately entitled. Ironically, the doctrine that the president of the church can't lead the church astray is precisely what allowed the church to be led astray. The short-term benefits of apparent organizational consensus generate a facade of unity, stability, and trustworthiness that keep members comfortable and engaged. The problem is clear that this is a counterfeit for a people who claim to care about truth over all else. Part of the reason this can be difficult for members of the church to see is because some that know either obscure or at least ignore the reality of how things really have been. For example, Joseph Fielding Smith, a church historian and eventual church president, taught, quote, There is no variance among the teachers in Israel concerning the principles of the gospel. We are united concerning these things. There is no division among the authorities, and there need be no divisions among the people, but of unity, peace, brotherly love, kindness, and fellowship one to another. This statement can only be considered accurate as aspirational rather than historical. Externally projected unity is no guarantee of actual unanimity, and even real unanimity is no guarantee of truth. As we noted that Adam-God doctrine faded away after Brigham's death, we naturally asked the question, what happened to the black priesthood ban after Brigham was no longer around to enforce it? Let's pick up that story in May of 1879, almost two years after Brigham's death, and John Taylor is kind of in charge as the president of the Quorum of the Twelve. I say kind of in charge because at that point, there was no church president because the Twelve couldn't agree on how to move forward. And four months after this, when John Taylor proposed to the Quorum of the Twelve that he would like to reorganize the First Presidency, they vetoed his request, quote, as altogether uncalled for and unbenefiting of the church. So it's in this environment that John Taylor decides to deal with an inconvenient but persistent issue. Even though Brigham had been teaching for his last 25 years as church president that black men, as descendants of Cain, were not eligible to receive the priesthood, Elijah Abel, a man with black ancestry that received the priesthood during Joseph Smith's lifetime and had served a mission for the church in New York and Canada in the late 1830s, was an active member living in Utah. Elijah Abel was ordained an elder in March of 1836 and shortly thereafter received his patriarchal blessing from Joseph Smith Sr. In December of 1836, he was ordained to 70. His 70 certificate was renewed in 1841 and again after his arrival in Salt Lake City in 1847. Abel also reportedly lived for a time in the Prophet Joseph's home, so it's no surprise that a couple of years after Brigham's death, a story would begin to circulate that Joseph Smith taught that black men could receive the priesthood. So John Taylor heard the story in 1879 and decided to find out if it was true. As the instructions were allegedly given to Zebedee Coltrane, John Taylor went to him for a first-hand account. When presented with the story, Coltrane replied that on the contrary, Joseph Smith had told him in 1834 that the Spirit of the Lord saith the Negro had no right nor cannot hold the priesthood. Though Coltrane acknowledged washing and anointing Elijah Abel in a ceremony in the Kirtland Temple after supposedly receiving these instructions, he stated that in so doing, he, quote, never had such unpleasant feelings in my life. And I said, I never would again anoint another person who had Negro blood in him unless I was commanded by the prophet to do so, end quote. Coltrane did not mention ordaining Abel a 70, probably at the direction of Joseph Smith, but he did state that he was a president of the 70s when the prophet Joseph directed that Abel be dropped because of his lineage. Abraham Smoot, at whose home the 1879 interview took place, added that he had also received instructions from Joseph similar to what Coltrane described in 1838. So when President Taylor reported the Coltrane and Smoot accounts to the Quorum of the Twelve the following week, 
Apostle Joseph F. Smith disagreed. Abel had not been dropped from the 70s, for Joseph F. Smith had seen his certifications as a 70 issued in 1841 and again in Salt Lake City in 1847. The minutes of the meeting read, quote, Brother Joseph F. Smith said he thought Brother Coltrane's memory was incorrect, and thus Brother Smoot's too, as to Brother Abel being dropped from the Quorum of Seventies, to which he belonged, as Brother Abel has in his possession, which also he had shown Brother Joseph F. Smith, his certificate as a Seventy, given to him in 1841, and signed by, Joseph, by Elder Joseph Young Sr. and A.P. Rockwood, and a still later one given in this city. Brother Abel's account of the persons who washed and anointed him in the Kirtland Temple also disagreed with the statement of Brother Coltrane, whilst he stated that Brother Coltrane ordained him a seventy. Brother Abel also states that the Prophet Joseph told him he was entitled to the priesthood. Abel's patriarchal blessing was read, which confirmed that Abel was an elder in 1836. The question under discussion was not whether blacks should be given the priesthood, but rather what had been the policy under Joseph Smith. Significantly, John Taylor, an apostle under the prophet Joseph for over five years, added no corroboration to the claims of Coltrane or Smoot. But, faced with the difficult prospect of having to justify Brigham's error if the evidence presented by Joseph F. Smith was considered, John Taylor decided that mistakes had been made in the early days of the church, which, been, which had been allowed to stand, and concluded that, quote, Probably it was so in Brother Abel's case, that he, having been ordained before the word of the Lord was fully understood, it was allowed to remain. John Taylor's conclusion, based on the evidence uncovered by Joseph F. Smith and his own experience with Joseph, was that Joseph was aware of and had authorized Elijah Abel's priesthood ordination, but that Joseph had made a mistake. John Taylor concluded that Joseph hadn't fully understood the word of the Lord while Brigham had. I think it's likely that Coltrane and Smoot, after listening to Brigham's sermons for over two decades, had mistakenly reinterpreted Joseph's original guidance to not proselytize or baptize slaves without their owner's consent, which would also necessarily preclude receiving the priesthood, because spreading ideas that caused slaves to become dissatisfied with their situation was against the law in states like Missouri in the 1830s. Although Elijah Abel's presence in Salt Lake City in 1879 had forced the brethren to address the question of the conflict between Joseph and Brigham's differences on race and access to the priesthood, he was not the only black man ordained to the priesthood during Joseph's lifetime. Quote, Quack Walker Lewis was one of at least three men of black African descent ordained to the Latter-day Saint priesthood during the lifetime of Joseph Smith. At the time of his conversion, Lewis was a prominent figure in the black communities in and around Boston and Lowell, Massachusetts. Not long after his baptism, LDS Apostle William Smith, the brother of Joseph Smith, ordained Lewis an elder. Ironically, Lewis emigrated to Utah just a few months before Brigham initiated the black priesthood ban and legalized slavery in Utah in early 1852. Unsurprisingly, Lewis, who was born free and had been a lifelong abolitionist, returned to Massachusetts before the end of 1852. After Brigham, who unilaterally launched the black priesthood ban in 1852, the church president most responsible for the perpetuation of the ban was church president Joseph F. Smith. As we discussed previously, in 1879, he defended Elijah Abel's priesthood as valid. In 1895, he reminded his fellow apostles that Abel was ordained to the priesthood, quote, at Kirtland under the direction of the prophet Joseph Smith. In 1904, he still referred to Abel's ordination as a mistake that, quote, was never corrected. But perplexingly, in 1908, then president of the church Joseph F. Smith changed his position to align with the Zebedee Coltrane account he debunked almost 30 years before, when he claimed that Abel's priesthood, quote, ordination was declared null and void by the prophet himself. Joseph F. Smith's change of view that associated the prophet Joseph with the priesthood ban falsely legitimized the practice in a way that likely perpetuated it for several decades longer than it otherwise might have lasted. I did not create this slide, but I like it because it's a concise summary of the issue. A few months ago, my dad invited me to go to a fireside with him where one of his former early morning seminary students named Jared Halverson now an associate professor of ancient scripture at BYU who does the Unshaken Gospel Study podcast, was giving a fireside on the history of the priesthood ban, and I got this slide from his presentation. I share that to point out that Joseph F. Smith's change in opinion on Joseph's role in the priesthood ban is not just something that I alone am asserting. It also represents the orthodox view on the issue. So we naturally ask ourselves, what happened between 1879, when Joseph F. defended Elijah Abel's priesthood as valid, and 1908, when he claimed that Abel's priesthood was declared null and void by Joseph himself? 
The primary reason Joseph F. changed his mind appears to have been a misinterpretation of the Pearl of Great Price, canonized for the first time in 1880, which inaccurately connected the priesthood curse on Pharaoh, who lived after the flood, back to Cain, who lived before the flood. A year after the canonization of the Pearl of Great Price, President John Taylor declared, quote, And after the flood we are told that the curse that had been pronounced upon Cain was continued through Ham's wife, as he had married a wife of that seed. And why did it pass through the flood? Because it was necessary that the devil should have a representation upon the earth as well as God. Remember that the Bible explains that the Lord's curse on Cain was agricultural, that the earth would not yield unto him its strength, but Brigham had been teaching for decades that the curse on Cain was priesthood-related. Here, President Taylor attempts to connect a different biblical curse, this one on Ham's posterity, with Brigham's priesthood curse on Cain. So who was Ham, and what was the curse pronounced upon his posterity? In Genesis chapter 9, we read that Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. At some point after the flood, we read, starting in verse 20, quote, And Noah began to be an husbandman. He planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine, and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment, and laid it upon both their shoulders, and went backward, and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine, and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. So first of all, it seems that some pretty important components of what happened between Noah and Ham are missing. First, it's unclear why Ham, seeing his father Noah naked while he was drunk, would merit a curse on his posterity. For me, the pseudepigraphal book of Jasher offers a plausible explanation for those missing pieces. The book explains that, quote, The garments of skin which God made for Adam and his wife when they went out of the garden were passed down from Adam to Enoch to Methuselah to Noah, and Noah took them and brought them to the ark, and they were with him until he went out of the ark. And in their going out, Ham stole those garments from Noah his father, and he took them and hid them from his brothers. To me, Noah's curse on Ham's posterity makes a lot more sense if Ham stole the garment of the holy priesthood from Noah when he was drunk, which is why Noah was naked in his tent. So when the garment, which was symbolically linked with both kingship and high priesthood in the holy order, was usurped by Ham, who apparently coveted Shem's, or Melchizedek's, rightful role to preside, God cursed Ham's posterity as pertaining to the priesthood, specifically Canaan's posterity, or the Canaanites, were to be servants to the posterity of Shem and Ham. Notice that Canaan specifically is singled out as the only one of Noah's grandchildren mentioned in connection with the curse. This curse on Canaan and his descendants, or the Canaanites, is also mentioned in the book of Abraham. The first chapter of the book of Abraham explains that the Egyptians, including their king Pharaoh, were descendants of Ham through Canaan. We read, quote, Now this king of Egypt was a descendant from the loins of Ham and was a partaker of the blood of the Canaanites by birth. This aligns with what we just read in Genesis 9 about Noah cursing Ham's descendants through Canaan. Continuing on, From this descent sprang all the Egyptians, and thus the blood of the Canaanites was preserved in the land. So the Canaanites, the originators of Egyptian culture, preserved Noah's curse in the land through the expansion of the Egyptian civilization. Understanding Noah's curse on his grandson Canaan and his posterity in Genesis chapter 9 provides important context for what's going on in the first chapter of the book of Abraham. Verses 26 and 27 clarify that Noah's curse on his grandson Canaan included a prohibition on holding the priesthood, quote, Pharaoh, being a righteous man, established his kingdom and judged his people wisely and justly all his days, seeking earnestly to imitate that order established by the fathers in the first generations, in the days of the first patriarchal reign, even in the reign of Adam and also of Noah his father, who blessed him with the blessings of the earth and with the blessings of wisdom, but cursed him as pertaining to the priesthood. Now Pharaoh, being of that lineage by which he could not have the right of priesthood, notwithstanding the Pharaohs would fain claim it from Noah, through Ham, therefore my father was led away by their idolatry. So far, what we read in the book of Abraham about a curse on the Canaanites aligns with the Bible in the ninth chapter of Genesis. Now this is where the confusion begins. When John Taylor claimed that after the flood we are told that the curse that had been pronounced upon Cain was continued through Ham's wife, as he had married a wife of that seed, 
This is very interesting because it ignores the biblical account in Genesis 9 about Canaan's posterity being cursed by Noah and replaces it with a speculative interpretation of the prophecy made by Enoch about a thousand years before the flood regarding a different group of people who are also known as the people of Canaan. If John Taylor's interpretation is correct, these references to the Canaanites in Abraham 1, 22, and 23 don't refer to the descendants of Ham's son of Canaan, but to a different people of Canaan that President Taylor believes were descendants of Cain. To sort this out, the first thing we need to do is be precise about exactly which group of Canaanites we're referring to. There are several names in the scriptures that sound the same, which we need to differentiate. Number one was Cain, Adam's son, who killed his brother Abel. Number two is Canaan, spelled C-A-I-N-A-N, who was a righteous patriarch in the third generation after Adam, who was born in the year 325. Number three is the land of Canaan where Enoch grew up, which was named after Canaan number two. Number four is a people of Canaan who lived in Enoch's day. Enoch was born in the year 622. These are the people that John Taylor thinks the book of Abraham is referring to in the blue boxes in Abraham 1, 21 and 22. Canaan number five is Ham's son who was cursed by Noah. These are the people I think the book of Abraham is referring to in the blue boxes in Abraham 1, 21, and 22 because that interpretation aligns with Genesis chapter 9. To be clear, there is roughly a thousand years between the people of Canaan number 4 and Canaan number 5, who was Ham's son and Noah's grandson. And last, Canaan number 6 was the land of Canaan promised to Abraham. It was called the land of Canaan because it was where the descendants of Canaan number five lived before the Israelites, who were Abraham's descendants, drove them out of the land. There's one more wrinkle to the Canaan confusion. When the Pearl of Great Price was printed by church headquarters for the first time in 1878, which was the version John Taylor would have had access to when he concluded that the Canaanites in the blue boxes were descendants of Cain, the people of Canaan number four was misspelled as Canaan with an I, C-A-I-N-A-N. -A -A the typeset version of the Pearl of Great Price on the bottom left is from the 1878 printing and consistently uses Canaan with an I, C-A-I-N-A-N, in place of the proper spelling Canaan, C-A-N-A-A-N, as we see on the right in the written transcript of Joseph's translation from the early 1830s. It's possible that President Taylor assumed the people of Canaan, number four, were associated with Cain, Adam's son who killed Abel, because of this misspelling, as the text never explicitly identifies the people of Canaan, number four, as descendants of Cain. To be fair to President Taylor, there are some ambiguous circumstantial similarities between the seed of Cain, which is how Moses specifically refers to Cain's posterity, and the people of Canaan, number four, in Enoch's day, but there are no definitive ties between the two. Those ambiguous circumstantial similarities show up in Moses chapter 7 in this sermon from Enoch, in which he explains, quote, And I saw the Lord, and he stood before my face, and he talked with me, even as a man talketh one with another face to face. And he said unto me, Look, and I will show unto thee the world for the space of many generations. And I beheld the people of Canaan. And the Lord said unto me, Prophesy, and I prophesied, saying, Behold, the people of Canaan, which are numerous, shall go forth in battle array against the people of Shum, and shall slay them, that they shall utterly be destroyed. And the land shall be barren and unfruitful, and none other people shall dwell there but the people of Canaan. For behold, the Lord shall curse the land with much heat, and there was a blackness came upon all the children of Canaan, that they were despised among all people. Later on, in the same chapter, after Zion is taken to heaven, starting in verse 22, we read, quote, and Enoch also beheld the residue of the people which were the sons of Adam, which I think means the residue of Adam's posterity left behind on the earth after Zion was taken up into heaven. And they were a mixture of all the seed of Adam, save it was the seed of Cain, for the seed of Cain were black and had not place among them. Here's where there are some similarities between the seed of Cain and the people of Canaan number four that may have encouraged President Taylor to assume they were the same. The seed of Cain were black and the children of Canaan had a blackness that came upon them. While Cain was cursed that the earth would not yield its strength to him, the land was cursed that the people of Canaan would occupy to be barren and unfruitful. And lastly, the seed of Cain had not place among the seed of Adam, while none other people would dwell with the people of Canaan, and they would be, quote, despised among all people. Now remember, the people of Canaan number four that Enoch mentions were contemporaries with Enoch, which we know from Moses 7.12, which reads, And it came to pass that Enoch continued to call upon all the people, save it were the people of Canaan, to repent. So when the Lord tells Enoch to prophesy, which typically involves future events, 
This matches with Enoch's language when he says in Moses chapter 7, verses 7 and 8, that the people of Canaan shall go forth and shall slay the people of Shum, who shall be utterly destroyed, and that after the victory the people of Canaan shall divide themselves in the land, and the land shall be barren and unfruitful, because the Lord shall curse the land with much heat. These elements of Enoch's prophecy all sound like things that are going to happen in the future or after the time when Enoch is prophesying these things. So when we then read about, quote, a blackness came upon all the children of Canaan, that could be a future event also, which would preclude the people of Canaan number four being of the seed of Cain, because in Enoch's day the people of Canaan number four would still have been white. Also, it's not clear that the blackness that came upon the children of Canaan number four was either a mark or a curse from the Lord, as none is specified, or if the blackness came as a result of the much heat. When we learn later on in Moses 7.12 that Enoch called upon all people, save it were the people of Canaan, we don't know why. It could have been that he wasn't welcomed there after his prophecies about their problematic future, or because they were a violent or war-loving people, as the prophecy indicates. The bottom line is that although there are some circumstantial similarities that may have encouraged President Taylor's interpretation, none of them are definitive. Another element to consider is that after Enoch saw Zion taken up into heaven in Moses 7.22, he saw that the seed of Cain had not place among the other descendants of Adam, which implies that if Ham's wife had been a descendant of Cain, there would have been no way for her and Ham to meet. Let's remember that the big question here is whether the blood of the Canaanites referred to in Abraham 1, 21 and 22, the ones in the blue boxes toward the top of the slide, that prevented Pharaoh from holding the priesthood, is referring to the descendants of Canaan number 5, which aligns with Genesis chapter 9, or whether it's referring to, as President Taylor believed, Ham's wife being a descendant from the people of Canaan number 4 that were contemporaries of Enoch, whom he believed were related to the seed of Cain because of the ambiguous circumstantial statements we just covered. Perhaps the biggest problem with President Taylor's interpretation is that, according to President Taylor's own logic, if Ham's wife had been a descendant of Cain, Ham's children would already have been prohibited from holding the priesthood, and Noah would have had no reason to curse Canaan because the curse would already have been in place. There is one more confusing issue in Abraham chapter 1 that contributed to President Taylor's problematic conclusion about Ham's wife being a descendant of Cain. In verse 23, we read that, quote, The land of Egypt being first discovered by a woman who was the daughter of Ham and the daughter of Egyptus, which in the Chaldean signifies Egypt, which signifies that which is forbidden. It's logical to assume that if the same mystery woman who discovered Egypt was the daughter of Ham and the daughter of Egyptus, that Egyptus was Ham's wife. The problem is that conclusion contradicts a subsequent verse. Let's keep reading. When this woman discovered the land, it was under water, who afterward settled her sons in it. And thus from Ham sprang that race which preserved the curse in the land. Now the first government of Egypt was established by Pharaoh, the eldest son of Egyptus, the daughter of Ham, and it was after the manner of the government of Ham which was patriarchal. Now this is the problem. Verse 23 indicates that Egyptus is Ham's wife, but verse 25 indicates that Egyptus is Ham's daughter. This is a clear contradiction. Given that dilemma, it would seem wise to avoid drawing a conclusion on whether Egyptus was Ham's wife or daughter without incremental clarifying information. While President Taylor's interpretation requires that Egyptus be Ham's wife, as verse 23 indicates, his interpretation is completely invalidated if Egyptus was Ham's daughter, as verse 25 indicates. Given the ambiguity created by the contradictory statements in verses 23 and 25, you might think President Taylor would have considered taking a less dogmatic stance. But remember that Brigham had been teaching for decades that the priesthood ban traced its legitimacy back to the Lord's curse on Cain. The story that Egyptus was Ham's wife, combined with the ambiguous passages that we previously reviewed, seemed to not only finally provide some scriptural support for Brigham's declarations, but also seemed to provide evidence that scripture revealed through the prophet Joseph also supported the ban. From that perspective, it's not hard to understand why President Taylor chose to stick with the interpretation that Egyptus was Ham's wife. It's interesting that if we go back to the earliest Kirtland-era manuscripts of the book of Abraham, and there are three, the name of Ham's wife is not Egyptus, but Zepta, spelled Z-E-P-T-A-H. In the blue box at the top of the slide we read, as well as in the transcript of that portion of the document on the right, quote, the land of Egypt being first discovered by a woman who was the daughter of Ham and the daughter of Zepta. It's also interesting if you notice the smaller blue box toward the bottom left on the slide, that in this particular manuscript, Ham's daughter was named Egyptes, spelled E-G-Y-P-T-E-S, rather than Egyptus with a U. Because the name Zepta, 
was replaced with the name Egyptus when this portion of the Book of Abraham was published in the Times and Seasons in 1842 while Joseph was still alive, it's understandable why the 1878 printing of the Pearl of Great Price continued using Egyptus rather than Zepta as the name of Ham's wife, even though it appears likely that a clerical error resulted in the name change from Zepta to Egyptus. From my perspective, the name Zepta makes far more sense because it can be traced back to the original manuscripts, and it resolves the contradiction between Abraham 1, 23 and 25 by making it clear that Egyptus, or Egyptes, was Ham's daughter. This, of course, completely invalidates President Taylor's assertion that Cain's seed survived the flood through Ham's wife, as well as Brigham's decades of teaching that black people were descendants of Cain. Regardless of the source of the confusion, President Taylor's problematic interpretation was readily adopted by other church leaders. Four years after President Taylor's quote we just addressed, B.H. Roberts published the following in the church's magazine called The Contributor, in which he asked, Now why is it that the seed of Ham was cursed as pertaining to the priesthood? Why is it that his seed could not have right to the priesthood? And below, was the wife of Ham, as her name signifies, of a race with which those who held the priesthood were forbidden to intermarry? Was she a descendant of Cain who was cursed for murdering his brother? Two years after that, President Woodruff taught the same thing in General Conference, quote, To commence with, I will touch upon the first dealings of God with man. The first son that was begotten by Father Adam, whose name was Cain, proved to be a murderer. The scriptures are clear that Adam and Eve had other children before Cain was born. This evidence of a cursory understanding of the scriptures by President Woodruff is surprising. In the fifth chapter of the book of Moses, we read, And Adam knew his wife, and she bare unto him sons and daughters, and they began to multiply and to replenish the earth. And from that time forth the sons and daughters of Adam began to divide two and two in the land, and to till the land into ten flocks, and they also begat sons and daughters. So at this point, not only have Adam and Eve had multiple sons and daughters, but those sons and daughters had begat children of their own, meaning that Adam and Eve were grandparents before Cain and Abel were born. We then read, And Adam and Eve blessed the name of God, and they made all things known unto their sons and their daughters, and they believed it not. It was after all this that we read in verse 16, And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord, wherefore he may not reject his words. Clearly, Cain was not Adam's first son, but President Woodruff was not aware of that. Anyway, moving on to the rest of President Woodruff's quote. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. What was the mark? It was a mark of blackness. The mark rested upon Cain and descended upon his posterity from that time until the present. Today there are millions of the descendants of Cain through the lineage of Ham in the world, and that mark of darkness still rests upon them. Though nearly 6,000 years have passed and gone, this mark is visible to the whole human family. Yet the fool and the infidel say there is no God, and they ridicule the Bible. Three and a half years after that Wilford Woodruff talk, George Q. Cannon, first counselor in the first presidency to President Woodruff and editor of the church's publication, The Juvenile Instructor, wrote this, also attempting to use the Pearl of Great Price to tie the priesthood curse back to Cain. Enoch, in speaking of the descendants of Cain, the man who slew his brother Abel, says, as recorded in the Pearl of Great Price, And the people of Canaan shall divide themselves in the land, and the land shall be barren and unfruitful, and none of the people shall dwell there but the people of Canaan. For behold, the Lord shall curse the land with much heat, and the barrenness thereof shall go forth forever. And there was a blackness came upon all the children of Canaan, that they were despised among all people. Notice the misspelling of Canaan as C-A-I-N-A-N, the same as in the 1878 printing of the Pearl of Great Price, which we covered previously. To a certain extent, it's surprising that, given what his peers were teaching, Joseph F. Smith defended the legitimacy of Elijah Abel's ordination to the priesthood as long as he did. In 1895, four years after the George Q. Cannon article we just reviewed, Joseph F. Smith reminded LDS leaders that Elijah Abel was ordained to the priesthood at Kirtland under the direction of the prophet Joseph Smith. During the same meeting, George Q. Cannon made a shocking claim that seems to have changed Joseph F.'s view on the matter. George Q. Cannon claimed that Joseph had taught that the seed of Cain could not receive the priesthood nor act in any of the offices of the priesthood until the seed of Abel should come forward and take precedence over Cain's offspring, and that any white man who mingled his seed with that of Cain should be killed and thus prevent any of the seed of Cain coming in possession of the priesthood. This was a startling assertion because, to my knowledge, no leader had ever claimed anything like this before in terms of attempting to link Joseph with such teachings. Even Wilford Woodruff, church president at the time and former apostle under the prophet Joseph Smith for five years, said nothing in the notes of this meeting about Joseph Smith's views. In retrospect, even if it had been true, it had almost no chance of being a first-hand account. 
as George Q arrived in Nauvoo in 1843 from Liverpool, England, as a 16-year-old boy, a year before Joseph died. But given George Q's characteristically forceful personality in the fog of war in that meeting of the Twelve, there's no mention in the notes that anybody asked George Q how he knew what he was claiming. That it wasn't first-hand information would become clear five years later in 1900, when Cannon repeated the same sentiment, but this time attributed it to John Taylor instead of Joseph Smith. George Q. Cannon, now first counselor to church president Lorenzo Snow, softened the attribution in 1900 to, quote, he understood that the prophet had said, eventually attributing the idea loosely to John Taylor rather than the prophet Joseph. He understood President Taylor to say that if the law of the Lord were administered upon him, he would be killed and his offspring. A much more likely source for this claim was Brigham, who routinely taught that kind of stuff. For example, in 1863, he taught, Shall I tell you the law of God in regard to the African race? If the white man who belongs to the chosen seed mixes his blood with the seed of Cain, the penalty under the law of God is death on the spot. Regardless of George Q's shifting sources, the assertion seems to have stuck. We know Joseph F. was influenced by George Q.'s undocumented, misattributed statement linking Joseph to the priesthood ban because in 1912, the First Presidency, led by then President of the Church Joseph F. Smith, wrote a letter to Milton H. Knudsen in which they asserted the prophet Joseph is said to have explained it in this way, referencing Cannon's argument. So that, I think, is a plausible scenario to explain why Joseph F. Smith, in 1908, contradicted his previous assertions that Elijah Abel's priesthood was valid and had been approved by the prophet Joseph. Once Joseph F. Smith declared that Elijah Abel's ordination had been invalidated and that Joseph had initiated the priesthood ban, it quickly became unquestioned doctrine among the brethren. Ultimately, Joseph F. decided to perpetuate the rulings of his predecessors. As we read from these 1908 council minutes, quote, with reference to the Negro question, President Joseph F. Smith remarked he did not know that we could do anything more in such cases than refer to the rulings of Presidents Young, Taylor Woodruff, and other presidencies on this question. An interesting explanation for Joseph F. Smith's otherwise unexplainable shift to legitimize the priesthood ban is provided by Paul Reeve, history professor at the University of Utah, who helped write the Church's Blacks in the Priesthood Gospel Topics essay in his book, Religion of a Different Color, which I highly recommend. Reeve hypothesizes that the white Protestant majority in the U.S. was so revolted by plural marriage that they effectively downgraded the genetically inbred Mormons to a racial status of less than white to help justify their expulsion from Ohio, Missouri, and Illinois. While Mormons argued that polygamy was ordained by God and thus created angelic, celestial, and elevated offspring, their opponents suggested that Mormon polygamous children were degenerate and deformed. The Protestant white majority was convinced that Mormonism represented not merely a religious but a racial departure from the mainstream and, and expended considerable effort in attempting to deny Mormons whiteness with its attendant political, social, and economic power. The cartoon on the cover is from 1904 and mockingly depicts Joseph F. Smith, identified by his long straight beard, as the father of many children from other marginalized races. Wikipedia attributes 48 children to Joseph F. Interestingly, 1904 was the same year Joseph F. was humiliated on the national stage in the Reed Smoot congressional hearings, like what the brethren did when they turned the word of wisdom into a commandment to claim Mormons had avoided alcohol since the 1830s to ingratiate themselves with the white evangelical Protestants leading the temperance movement in the early 1900s, which I explained in the first 20 minutes of my video, Rejecting the Fullness. Joseph F. Smith's illegitimate tracing of the Mormon priesthood ban to Joseph served to reinforce the legitimacy of the ban in a way that may have been influenced by a subconscious desire to socially reclaim Mormon whiteness. The disturbing thing is it may have worked. So successful have Mormons been at claiming whiteness for themselves by, in large measure, prohibiting blacks from holding the priesthood until 1978, that by the time member Mitt Romney ran for president in 2012, the Atlantic made this declaration, quote, the simple, impolitely stated fact is that Mitt Romney is the whitest white man to run for president in recent memory. Mitt ought to thank Joseph F. for that designation, as President Smith was the first president to tie the priesthood ban to the prophet Joseph and the foundations of the church. Apostle Joseph Fielding Smith, pictured here with his father, President Joseph F. Smith, wrote this in the Approvement Era in 1924. It is true that the Negro race is barred from holding the priesthood. And this has always been the case. The prophet Joseph taught this doctrine as it was made known to him, although we know of no such statement in any revelation in the Doctrine and Covenants, Book of Mormon, or the Bible. However, in the Pearl of a Great Price we find, 
and then he cites the problematic story of Egyptus as Ham's wife as justification. Joseph Fielding Smith would apparently carry these beliefs to the grave as church president in 1972. He believed what his father taught him, even though we now understand it wasn't true. So now that we've looked at how the priesthood ban started and gained legitimacy over time, let's fast forward to 1947 and the first presidency consisting of President George Albert Smith in the middle, first counselor J. Reuben Clark on the left, and second counselor David O. McKay on the right. Dr. Lowry Nelson, a sociologist at Utah State University, wrote a letter to the First Presidency in June of 1947 that read, in part, quote, The attitude of the church in regard to the Negro makes me very sad. I must say that I have never been able to accept the idea, and never shall. I do not believe that God is a racist. There cannot be world peace until the pernicious doctrine of the superiority of one race and the inferiority of others is rooted out. This is my belief. I wanted you to know my feelings on this question and trust you will understand the spirit in which I say these things. I want to see us promote love and harmony among peoples of the earth. The next month, the First Presidency responded. They wrote, quote, Your position seems to lose sight of the revelations of the Lord touching the pre-existence of our spirits, the rebellion in heaven, and the doctrines that are birthed into this life, and the advantages under which we may be born have a relationship in the life heretofore. This is a doctrine the church repudiates today. In the church's race in the priesthood essay, it states, Today the church disavows the theories advanced in the past that black skin is a sign of divine disfavor or curse, or that it reflects unrighteous actions in a premortal life. The use of the word disavow is an interesting choice in that it means to deny any responsibility or support for. We can't deny responsibility or support for what the First Presidency said in their 1947 letter without accepting that the Church's most senior leaders are capable of leading members astray without being immediately removed by the Lord from their position. After signing the letter to Dr. Nelson in July of 1947, President Grant continued as President of the Church until April of 1951, nearly four years. Their letter continues, from the days of the prophet Joseph, even until now, it has been the doctrine of the church, never questioned by any of the church leaders, that the Negroes are not entitled to the full blessings of the gospel. Although it took us a bit of time and effort, we now have the background context to understand that this statement is totally false. What are the implications of this 1947 letter? What we see in 1947 is proof of well-intentioned but mistaken leaders teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. Even though Brigham is ultimately responsible for the introduction of the race ban to the church in 1852, it's clear that the first presidency of the church 95 years later was still unwittingly leading the church astray. Two years later, in 1949, the same first presidency issued a statement reinforcing the same claims, quote, The attitude of the church with reference to Negroes remains as it has always stood. It is not a matter of the declaration of policy, but of direct commandment from the Lord, on which is founded the doctrine of the church from the days of its organization, to the effect that Negroes may become members of the church, but that they are not entitled to the priesthood at the present time. The position of the church regarding the Negro may be understood when another doctrine of the church is kept in mind, namely that the conduct of spirits in the premortal existence has some determining effect upon the conditions and circumstances under which these spirits take on mortality. Under this principle, there is no injustice whatsoever involved in this deprivation as to the holding of the priesthood by the Negroes. Two years later, in 1951, President George Albert Smith passed away and David O. McKay became the next church president. 1954 was an important year in the civil rights movement as the Supreme Court overturned segregation. In retrospect, the winds of change were also blowing at the highest levels of the church in the same direction. Early in 1954, David O. McKay, who had been church president for three years, visited South Africa and relaxed the requirement that all worthy males had to trace their genealogy out of Africa before they could receive the priesthood. During that trip, he referred to the priesthood ban three times as a policy rather than doctrine. To one prominent church member who rejected the legitimacy of the priesthood ban, President McKay confided that, quote, there is not now, and there never has been a doctrine in this church that the Negroes are under a divine curse. We believe that we have scriptural precedent for withholding the priesthood from the Negro, it is a practice, not a doctrine, and the practice will someday be changed, and that's all there is to it. This was a major shift from just five years before, as the First Presidency statement that we reviewed on the previous slide stated that the ban, quote, is not a matter of the declaration of a policy, but of a direct commandment from the Lord, end quote. Downgrading the ban from doctrine to policy was an important first step in overturning it. 
Leonard Arrington, who would later become the church historian, explained that, quote, a special committee of the Twelve appointed by President McKay in 1954 to study the issue of the race-based priesthood ban concluded that there was no sound scriptural basis for the policy, but that the church membership was not prepared for its reversal. This is fascinating, as with no sound scriptural basis to stand on, the only remaining rationale to justify the ban was speculation about one's behavior in the preexistence. It's unclear if any evidence existed to back up the assertion that church membership was not prepared for its reversal. There is, however, clear evidence to indicate that a significant portion of the apostles were not prepared for its reversal. While President McKay had concluded in 1954 that the ban had been a policy and not a legitimate doctrine, some of the apostles vehemently disagreed, and he seems to have been influenced by them. Apostle Joseph Fielding Smith, author of the 1924 article in the Approvement Era that we looked at a few minutes ago, was the president of the Quorum of the Twelve during David O. McKay's entire church presidency. He gave an interview to Look Magazine in 1963. The article reads, The Negro cannot achieve priesthood in the Mormon church. President Smith said, No consideration is being given now to changing the doctrine of the church to permit him to attain that status. Such a change can come about only through divine revelation, and no one can predict when a divine revelation will occur. I would not want you to believe that we bear any animosity toward the Negro. Darkies are wonderful people, and they have their place in our church. These pictures of the First Presidency on the left and the Quorum of the Twelve on the right were taken in 1963 and 1965, respectively. Next in apostolic seniority, Elder Harold B. Lee, as a member of the Board of Trustees of Brigham Young University, was in favor of barring blacks entirely from the university. He told BYU President Ernest L. Wilkinson in 1960 that, quote, if a granddaughter of mine should ever go to the BYU and become engaged to a colored boy there, I would hold you responsible. Elder Lee's daughter told a friend, quote, my daddy said that as long as he's alive, they'll never have the priesthood. He was right about that. Ezra Taft Benson, in a general conference talk in October of 1967, made it clear that he believed the priesthood ban was initiated by the prophet Joseph and thus doctrinally justified. He taught, quote, The arm of flesh may not approve nor understand why God has not bestowed the priesthood on women or the seed of Cain, but God's ways are not man's ways. The prophet Joseph Smith understood this principle when he said, The curse is not yet taken off from the sons of Canaan, neither will be until it is affected by as great a power as caused it to come. While Joseph did write those words about the curse on the sons of Canaan in defense of church members in Missouri who were facing charges of abolitionism, which was illegal in Missouri in 1836, they clearly had nothing to do with disallowing black men from receiving the priesthood because Joseph allowed it. It was Joseph F. Smith's reversal on the legitimacy of Elijah Abel's priesthood and his unjustified attribution of the ban to Joseph in 1908 that encouraged Elder Benson's incorrect view, linking the biblical curse on Canaan, to Brigham's priesthood ban. Elder Marky e. Peterson gave a talk to religion professors at BYU in 1954 in which he taught, quote, who placed the Negroes originally in darkest Africa? Was it some man or was it God? And when he placed them there, he segregated them. He certainly segregated the descendants of Cain when he cursed the Negroes to the priesthood and drew an absolute line. You may even say he dropped an iron curtain there. The Negro was cursed as to the priesthood and therefore was cursed as to the blessings of the priesthood. Certainly God made a segregation there. What God hath separated, let not man bring together again. In October 1965, the First Presidency and the Twelve were discussing the opening of Nigeria for missionary work, a project in which President McKay was very interested. Harold B. Lee was opposed to the initiative as he feared it might invite external pressure to, quote, bring them in as full-fledged members with the priesthood and all, end quote. Elder Marky e. Peterson thought the program would do the church great damage. Elder Benson added that Martin Luther King was an agent, if not a power, in the Communist Party and suggested the project be terminated. Gordon B. Hinckley expressed concern that opening a mission in Nigeria might offend those from South Africa who opposed desegregation. He mentioned his recent conversation with the returning president of the South African mission, who had similarly, quote, expressed the fear that if we took an interest in the Negroes, it would jeopardize our position in South Africa. At that point in the meeting, Elder Peterson moved that the initiative be scrapped immediately, which was seconded and unanimously approved. President McKay, though present at the meeting, declined to exercise his prerogative as church president to veto the proposal. During the meeting of the five senior most apostles in the quorum, only one did not express an opinion, and that was Spencer W. Kimball. 
13 years later, he would be the one to receive the revelation that reversed the priesthood ban. One of the 15 senior brethren believed that the ban was a policy and not a legitimate doctrine, and consistently worked to try and get it overturned. His name was Hubie Brown, and he was called as an apostle in 1958 and into the First Presidency in 1961. He was the first counsel in the First Presidency from 1963 until 1970, when President McKay passed away. In January of 1962, in a meeting of the First Presidency, in a discussion about several hundred Nigerians who had taken upon themselves the name of the church and were requesting missionaries be sent to baptize them, President Brown made a proposal that had not previously been considered. He said, quote, I wonder if the time is coming when we will give the lesser priesthood to them. President McKay responded, musing, quote, If we could just give them the Aaronic priesthood, I suppose there is no way to differentiate. The Lord will have to do it. In June 1963, President Brown, who at the time was the second counsel in the first presidency, went public in his attempt to reverse the ban on priesthood ordination by unilaterally initiating an interview with the New York Times. The article read, quote, The top leadership of the Mormon Church is seriously considering the abandonment of its historic policy of discriminating against Negroes. One of the highest officers of the Church said today that the possibility of removing this religious disability against Negroes has been under serious consideration. We are in the midst of a survey looking toward the possibility of admitting Negroes, said Hubie Brown, one of the two counselors serving President David O. McKay in the First Presidency of the Mormon Church. Believing as we do in divine revelation through the president of the church, we all await his decision, end quote. After the article blindsided and upset President McKay, he still decided to move Elder Brown from second counselor to first counselor four months later. Before October General Conference in 1963, the NAACP was planning on picketing at General Conference because Utah was the only western state that had not passed laws guaranteeing basic civil rights for minority groups, and the local NAACP officers had tried without success to meet with the First Presidency and enlist their support for such legislation. The night before conference, President Brown met with them and agreed to read a statement in support of civil rights at conference if they would cancel the planned demonstration. President McKay approved the statement, but asked Hubie Brown to merely include it in his prepared address rather than presenting it as an official First Presidency statement. The statement included these words, quote, We call upon all men everywhere, both within and outside the church, to commit themselves to the establishment of full civil equality for all of God's children. Anything less than this defeats our high ideal of the brotherhood of man. Wishing to maximize the impact of the statement while complying with President McKay's request, President Brown read it at the beginning of his talk very much as if he were reading a separate official statement from the First Presidency. Then he set it aside and proceeded with his own address. The approach was quite effective, and the picketing was called off. When JFK took office in 1961, he chose two Mormons for prominent national positions. Stuart Udall, a former congressman from Arizona, was appointed as Secretary of the Interior, and Sterling McMurrin, initially a church education system seminary teacher and institute director, who later became a philosophy professor and administrator at the University of Utah, was appointed as the Commissioner of Education. Both Udall and McMurrin privately communicated with President Brown throughout the 1960s, and all three were hopeful about overturning the ban. In 1967, Udall published a letter urging the Brethren to abandon the priesthood ban. He wrote, quote, The issue must be resolved. It must be resolved because we are wrong, and it is past the time when we should have seen the right. A failure to act here is sure to demean our faith, damage the minds and morals of our youth, and undermine the integrity of our Christian ethic. Every Mormon knows that his church teaches that the day will come when the Negro will be given full fellowship. Surely that day has come. It was published in Dialogue, a journal of Mormon thought, and Udall simultaneously sent copies to the New York Times and the Associated Press. In 1968, McMurrin, at that point back at the University of Utah, spoke to the Salt Lake branch of the NAACP criticizing the church's priesthood ban. He said, quote, for any church to deny full religious fellowship to an individual on grounds related essentially on his race or color is an almost unbelievable moral deficiency that deserves the most rigorous condemnation. President McKay believed in and promoted freedom of thought amongst church members, while Joseph Fielding Smith and Harold B. Lee were in favor of constraining belief to a fixed set of orthodox doctrines. An example of this was manifest in 1954, when Apostles Smith and Lee pushed to have McMurrin, a former seminary teacher and institute director, excommunicated for his heretical views. In response, 
McKay met privately with McMurrin and offered to be the first witness in McMurrin's defense if a church court was convened. When Smith and Lee heard of President McKay's offer, they dropped the issue. In 1968, after McMurrin's NAACP talk criticizing the church for the continuation of the race ban, Joseph Fielding Smith again pushed for McMurrin to be excommunicated. Although McKay was not pleased with McMurrin's comments, McKay once again deflected Smith's initiative and the matter was dropped. It was also in that same year, 1968, that the first public protest against BYU at athletic events occurred due to the church's race ban. In the spring of 1968, seven black track athletes from the U University of Texas at El Paso announced they would not compete against BYU because of the church's black doctrine. All seven athletes lost their scholarships. In the fall of 1968, seven San Jose State University football players refused to play BYU. They also lost their scholarships, but the university president collected private donations and promised to give them equivalent funds toward their education. In October of 1969, 14 black players from the University of Wyoming decided not to play against BYU and were dismissed from the team. Wyoming still beat BYU by 33 points. In the fall of 1969, student groups from the University of Arizona, Arizona State, the University of New Mexico, Colorado State, and Wyoming formally voiced support for black athletes, and five schools refused to schedule any more games against BYU, including Stanford University and the University of Washington. Stanford's boycott of BYU sports lasted until 1979. Protests at games were common and sometimes became violent. A sign seen at a BYU versus Colorado State game in 1970 sums up the national sentiment toward BYU and the church. The sign read, Bigot Young University. It was in this environment of significant external pressure on the church to change the race ban that in late 1969, as President McKay's health continued to deteriorate, that President Hubie Brown became aware of, for the first time, President McKay's 1954 statement that the ban was a practice rather than a doctrine. This emboldened President Brown to push for an administrative reversal of the ban while President McKay was still alive. During the last few years of David O. McKay's presidency, he called three additional counselors into the first presidency for a total of five. One of those counselors, Alvin R. Dyer, noted in his diary in October of 1969 that President Brown, quote, had tried twice of late to get President McKay to withdraw the withholding of the priesthood from the Negro, but President McKay had refused to move on it. Dyer, who viewed the priesthood ban as doctrinally sound, feared the policy could indeed be changed by simple administrative action. As Dyer was subordinate to Brown in the hierarchy, Dyer moved to enlist a powerful ally, Harold B. Lee, acting president of the Quorum of the Twelve, in an attempt to block the possibility of an administrative reversal. Indeed, just three weeks later, on October 27, 1969, Harold B. Lee told BYU President Ernest L. Wilkinson that he, quote, would not consent to any change of policy as respects the Negro problem. Harold B. Lee took the unprecedented action, as he was not in the first presidency himself, of beginning to draft a first presidency statement that would block any attempts to modify the policy administratively. The statement went through several drafts, finally including language insisted on by Brown that strongly endorsed civil rights at the same time that it closed the door on a reversal of the priesthood ban. By the time the statement was finalized, McKay's condition had deteriorated, had deteriorated to the point where he was unable to sign it. It carried the signatures only of Brown and Tanner, the highest ranking of the five First Presidency counselors. It included these words, quote, From the beginning of this dispensation, Joseph Smith and all succeeding presidents of the church have taught that Negroes were not yet to receive the priesthood for reasons which we believe are known to God, but which he has not made fully known to man. While the statement seems to back away from prior claims to understand why the ban had been applied, this may have been seen as a way to bolster the increasingly indefensible position the church was trying to protect. There are reasons, the statement assures, but only God knows them. Yet upon closer inspection, the old justifications still show through with the inclusion of the quote in the upper right. Quote, Revelation assures us that this plan antedates man's mortal existence, extending back to man's pre-existent state. Also note the signatories. Ironically, it was only Hubie Brown who was compelled to sign it, and Elder Tanner who didn't initiate the statement. This is the version of the document released in January of 1970 in the Church News as a, quote, policy statement of presidency that was initiated by Harold B. Lee. 
the 86-year-old Hubie Brown signed the statement only under great pressure, as he related to his grandson, who explained, quote, Grandfather, Hubie Brown, suffered from advanced age and the late stages of Parkinson's disease and was ill with the Asian flu. With grandfather in this condition, Elder Lee brought tremendous pressure to bear upon him, arguing that with President McKay incapacitated, grandfather was obliged to join the consensus within the Quorum of the Twelve. Grandfather, deeply ill, wept as he related this story to me just before he signed the statement that bore his and President Tanner's names. The First Presidency Statement was sent to all local church leaders, many of whom read it to their congregations. The statement was published in the church news on January 10, 1970. Eight days later, President McKay died and the First Presidency automatically dissolved. Joseph Fielding Smith succeeded David O. McKay as church president, with Harold B. Lee as his first counselor and N. Eldon Tanner as his second. Hubie Brown reverted to his position in the Quorum of the Twelve, the first time since the death of Brigham Young in 1877 that a counselor in the First Presidency had not been retained by a succeeding church president. Unsurprisingly, neither Joseph Fielding Smith nor Harold B. Lee would alter the priesthood ban during their presidencies. Joseph Fielding Smith was the president of the church from 1970 until July of 1972 when he passed away, and Harold B. Lee was the president of the church for 18 months, from July of 1872 until December of 1973. Four months before President Lee died, research was published that would eventually change the church's trajectory on the priesthood ban. Lester Bush was working as a doctor in the Army when he published this paper, Mormonism's Negro Doctrine and Historical Overview, in Dialogue, a Journal of Mormon Thought, in August of 1973. Including footnotes, it's nearly 70 pages long. It clearly documents that the priesthood ban did not begin with Joseph, but with Brigham. He gave a copy to Elder Packer before publication, and while Elder Packer said the church would prefer it not be published, since Bush had already committed it for publication, Elder Packer indicated there was nothing that could be done. At the time the article was published, a church employee walked into the office of Apostle Bruce R. McConkie, who was facing away in his chair reading Bush's article intently, and as the employee approached, wheeled around and slammed the magazine with the essay down on his desk and definitively pronounced it crap. That being said, four years later in June 1977, President Kimball invited at least three general authorities to give him memos on the implications of changing the race ban. And Elder, and Elder McConkie wrote a long memorandum concluding that there was no scriptural barrier to a change in policy that would give priesthood to black men. In 1974, Elder Hartman Rector, a general authority and member of the First Council of Seventy, told Lester Bush that after reading the article he had changed his opinion and had come to believe that had Joseph Smith lived longer, blacks would never have been denied the priesthood. Nearly two years after the paper was published, Elder Marion D. Hanks, who had been a general authority since 1953 and who'd been working as an assistant to the Quorum of the Twelve since 1968, wrote Brother Bush a letter in which, commenting on his paper on the priesthood ban, Elder Hanks explained, quote, The other copy you deposited with one of the brethren, which most likely was the copy he had given to Elder Packer, probably had a far greater effect than was acknowledged to you or than has yet been evidenced. Recent conversations suggest that this is so. As Elder Hanks explained to another researcher subsequently, Brother Bush's paper, quote, started to foment the pot. And a couple of weeks before the reversal of the priesthood ban in 1978, Elder Markey Peterson called President Kimball's attention to an article, almost certainly Bush's, that proposed the priesthood policy had begun with Brigham Young and not Joseph Smith, and he suggested that the president might wish to consider this factor. President Kimball announced in June of 1978 that a revelation had been received that rescinded the race ban. I'd like to look at what happened leading up to that revelation. In May 1975, President Kimball referred to his counselors various statements by early church leaders about blacks in the priesthood and asked for their reactions. He asked the apostles to join him as colleagues in extended study and supplication. Dallin H. Oaks, president of BYU in 1978, recalled, quote, President Kimball asked me what I thought were the reasons for the priesthood ban. He talked to dozens of people, maybe hundreds of people, about why, why do we have this? End quote. Years earlier, talking about Revelation in general, Spencer had written in a letter to his son, quote, Revelations will probably never come unless they are desired. I think few people receive revelations while lounging on the couch or while playing cards or while relaxing. 
I believe most revelations would come when a man is on his tiptoes, reaching as high as he can for something which he knows he needs, and then there bursts upon him the answer to his problems. Preston Kimball described the struggle he faced in this time frame, quote, day after day, and especially on Saturdays and Sundays when there were no organizations or sessions in the temple, I went there when I could be alone. I was very humble. I was searching for this. I wanted to be sure. I had a great deal to fight, myself largely, because I had grown up with this thought that Negroes should not have the priesthood, and I was prepared to go all the rest of my life until my death and fight for it and defend it as it was. The way President Kimball's son Edward, who was a professor at the BYU Law School and who wrote his father's biography, where many of these quotes on President Kimball came from, described his father's experience with these words, quote, In spite of his preconceptions and his allegiance to the past, a swelling certainty grew that a change in policy was what the Lord wanted, end quote. In President Kimball's own words, quote, There grew slowly a deep, abiding impression to go forward with the change. On March 23rd of 1978, President Kimball reported to his counselors that he had spent much of the night in reflection, and his impression then was to lift the restriction. On May 30th, 1978, Spencer read his counselors a tentative statement in longhand removing racial restrictions on priesthood and said he had a, quote, good warm feeling about it. Two days later, on June 1st, 1978, the day the revelation was received, the Twelve and First Presidency were meeting together. President Kimball outlined to them the direction his thoughts had carried him, the fading of his reluctance, the disappearance of objections, the growing assurance he had received, the tentative decision he had reached, and his desire for a clear answer. Once more he asked the Twelve to speak without concern for seniority. The discussion lasted for two hours. Describing the meeting, Elder Packer said, quote, One objection would have deterred him, would have made him put it off, so careful was he, that it had to be right, end quote. President Kimball then asked, quote, Do you mind if I lead in prayer? He had reached a decision after great struggle, and he wanted the Lord's confirmation if it would come. Elder McConkie described what happened next with these words, quote, The twelve and the three members of the First Presidency had the Holy Ghost to send upon them, and they knew that God had manifested His will. Perhaps most significant was that the spirit President Kimball described was a rushing flood of unity that he had never felt before, and that may not have been possible before the truth of the ban having its origin with Brigham rather than Joseph was understood by the senior brethren. Apostle Howard W. Hunter said, quote, Following the prayer, comments were made about the feeling shared by all, that seldom, if ever, had there been greater unanimity in the council. And similarly, President Kimball said, quote, I felt an overwhelming spirit there, a rushing flood of unity such as we had never had before. Given everything that we understand now, I think we ought to consider the possibility that, given the unity of thought and feeling that existed among the Church's senior brethren in June of 1978, the Lord confirmed President Kimball's conclusion reversing the priesthood ban because it was a practice that never had God's heavenly sanction to begin with. Throughout the history of the ban, we see the downgrading of ideas from dogmatically declared doctrine to administrative policy to easily dismissible theory. To Time Magazine reporter Richard Osling, shortly after the restriction was lifted in 1978, President Kimball stated that, quote, Mormonism no longer holds to a theory that blacks failed God during their preexistence. That same year, Apostle Legrand Richards explained in a private interview that, quote, The brethren decided that we should never say that the Negro was denied for being less valiant in the previous existence, or that they were cursed with a dark skin. We just don't know what the reason was. Church President Gordon B. Hinckley, in an interview with a reporter in Australia, claimed he did not know what the reason was for denying blacks the priesthood, but did not think it was wrong. And in a 2002 ceremony honoring Elijah Abel, Apostle Russell Ballard explained to the audience that we don't know all the reasons why the Lord does what he does, referring to the priesthood ban. Elder Ballard's logic ignores the much more likely explanation that the Lord didn't have anything to do with the priesthood ban except allowing it to occur, like he usually does with most types of wickedness. So let's take a step back. Our current understanding of Brigham's impact on the doctrine and structure of the church that Joseph founded and left behind is often muted because the church has slowly gone through a process of what I consider purification, during which it has eliminated most of the innovations Brigham introduced, 
while at the same time reinforcing a narrative that emphasizes Brigham's perceived importance to the development of the church. These include the temple oath to avenge the blood of Joseph and Hiram, the black priesthood ban, Adam-God doctrine, plural marriage, blood atonement, the reckoning of apostolic seniority, and the apostles presiding over established stakes. In addition, Brigham said a lot of strange things, some of which were clearly false prophecies. Before we look at his larger structural and doctrinal innovations, let's review some of those false prophecies. For example, at conference in 1845, Brigham announced, quote, Know ye not that the millennium has commenced? His declaration contradicted 14 years of Mormon teachings that the millennium would be ushered in by a dramatic second coming of Christ and God's destruction of the wicked. Instead, Young's announcement indicated that the death of a prophet and the triumph of anti-Mormon mobs had immediately preceded the millennium. Never a theologian, Young did not spell out the doctrinal implications of his words. However, his statement to the April conference was not a spontaneous expression, but a well-considered view. In a meeting of the apostles with several council of 50 members five weeks earlier, William W. Phelps noted, quote, B. Young has found out that we are in eternity, and the millennium has now commenced. In August of 1856, Brigham publicly prophesied, quote, 26 years will not pass away before the elders of this church will be as much thought of as the kings on their thrones. 26 years later, this political cartoon captioned, quote, pure white Mormon immigration on the Atlantic coast, more cheap helpmates for Mr. Polygamist, appeared in Harper's Weekly, painting LDS men as exploitative misogynists. This representation of a Mormon elder's delusive bait and switch to ensnare innocent female converts follows the same thing and was published the same year. The next year, this illustration appeared reminding the public that one of the twin relics of barbarism was still very much alive, as Mormon elders or wolves checked out unsuspecting lambs arriving from Europe. Far from being seen as kings, the elders here are represented as lecherous, opportunistic, creepy old men preying on recent female immigrants. Brigham's polygamy made Mormons one of the most despised religious groups in the U.S. from the 1860s until the early 1900s, and his race ban did the same from the mid-1950s until the late 1970s. We can only speculate how much these policies inhibited the consideration of the Book of Mormon as a legitimate book of scripture by truth seekers. If you want to know what polygamy meant for girls in Brigham's day, Consider some of the recently released documentaries about fundamentalist LDS leaders and their targeting of young girls. A 1987 study at BYU found that 60% of plural wives were under the age of 20. Perhaps most revealing is an 1857 letter Apostle Wilford Woodruff wrote to fellow Apostle George A. Smith in which he explained, quote, All are trying to get wives until there is hardly a girl 14 years old in Utah but what is married or just going to be. It's safe to say that Brigham's prophecy that the world would think of LDS elders as kings on their thrones within 26 years didn't happen. On July 7, 1863, Brigham Young spoke about a future complex of 24 temples in Independence, Missouri, quote, a tower upon each, then a main high tower in the center with gardens on the top of the towers with fruit and flowers growing thereon. On July 8, 1861, he said this temple complex would cover 10 acres of land. On August 23, 1868, Apostle Wilford Woodruff tells a congregation in Logan, Utah, that within 30 years, New York City will be destroyed by the sea heaving itself beyond its bounds and washing the inhabitants into the sea. Albany, New York, will be utterly destroyed by fire. Boston will be sunk with an earthquake, and Chicago will be burned with fire. As for the United States, it will be broken to pieces. Brigham Young says Woodruff's remarks are given by revelation. Although Mormons regard Chicago Fire of 1871 as fulfillment of this prophecy, they donate for the relief of the sufferers. On July 8, 1860, Brigham Young preaches, Children are now born who will live until every son of Adam will have the privilege of receiving the principles of eternal life. And in October of 1863, which was in the middle of the Civil War, which lasted from April of 1861 to April of 1865, Brigham Young prophesied in general conference that the Civil War would not free the slaves. Quote, what is the cause of all this waste of life and treasure? To tell it in a plain, truthful way, one portion of the country wished to raise their Negroes or black slaves, and the other portion wished to free them, and apparently to almost worship them. Well, raise and worship them, who cares? 
I should never fight one moment about it, for the cause of human improvement is not in the least advanced by the dreadful war which now convulses our unhappy country. Ham will continue to be the servant of servants, as the Lord has decreed, until the curse is removed. Will the present struggle free the slave? No. U.S. President Abraham Lincoln had already signed in June of 1862 a law which prohibited slavery in all federal territories, and this emancipated the few dozen slaves in Utah. The 13th Amendment would legally end slavery everywhere in the United States in 1865. Incidentally, in March of 1865, a month before the South surrendered to the North, Heber C. Kimball told uh, Apostle Wilford Woodruff, quote, the North will never have the power to crush the South. No, never. Okay, so let's quickly review Brigham's major innovations. Regardless of what Joseph had revealed in the Book of Mormon, that, quote, man shall not smite, neither shall he judge, for judgment is mine, saith the Lord, and vengeance is mine also, and I will repay. Brigham's temple oath to avenge the blood of the prophets was part of the endowment ceremony from 1845 to 1927. The oath of vengeance seems thematically related to the violence embodied in the doctrine of blood atonement. If you'd like more information on what blood atonement means, please see my video entitled Rejecting the Fullness. While public teaching of blood atonement dissipated in the latter half of the 1800s, the private perpetuation and reinforcement of the temple oath to kill those involved in the murders of church leaders like Joseph, Hiram, and Parley P. Pratt persisted a half century longer. The Black Priesthood Ban, which we have just covered, lasted for 126 years from 1852 until 1978. The longevity of Brigham's priesthood ban can be attributed, as we covered previously, to President Joseph F. Smith. Public preaching of Adam-God doctrine seems to have ended at Brigham's death in 1877. Plural marriage as an innovation introduced to the church by Brigham is covered in a separate video I made entitled First LDS Polygamist, Joseph or Brigham. Even though the church formally banned new plural marriages in 1904, existing plural marriages were considered legitimate until previously married plural spouses passed away. Heber J. Grant was the church's last polygamous president, and he didn't pass away until 1945. Although the church attempts to distance itself doctrinally from polygamy as something practiced in the distant past, the specter of ongoing orthodox polygamy continued to haunt the church into the 1950s. Consider President Spencer W. Kimball's wife, Camilla Irene Kimball, who was born to polygamous parents and died in 1987, and who was the aunt of President Henry B. Eyring of the First Presidency. Although less commonly understood, Brigham made significant changes to church policy regarding apostolic seniority, which provide a useful window to better understand his aspirations and methods. As many church members are unaware of Brigham's efforts in this regard, it seems worth it to describe what happened. There are 14 pivotal moments in the unfolding of how the determination of apostolic seniority changed from Joseph's original definition in 1835 until 1900 when the church arrived at the approach used today. Why does this matter? Well, for example, without the changes documented here, Orson Pratt and not John Taylor would have been the third president of the church. The church operated for its first five years without a quorum of 12 apostles. In 1835, it wasn't Joseph who called the initial 12 apostles. It was the three witnesses to the Book of Mormon, who all later apostatized, that selected the original 12 apostles, including Brigham Young. Joseph never ordained Brigham an apostle. Brigham was ordained by one of the three witnesses. Joseph instructed the original twelve to reckon their seniority by age. Specifically, he explained, quote, it will be the duty of the twelve when in council to take their seats together according to their ages. In 1839, the First Presidency clarified that when a new group of apostles joined the quorum, the oldest would rank highest, but only within the newly entering group, not with respect to pre-existing members of the quorum. They wrote, quote, appoint the oldest of those twelve who were first appointed to be the president of your quorum. Since Brigham was the oldest of the original twelve initially called in 1835, he became the president of the Quorum of the Twelve. For example, when Lyman White became an apostle in 1841, he was the lowest in seniority, even though he was five years older than Brigham. This is where things get interesting. In 1855, Brigham endowed and then secretly ordained his 11-year-old son John Willard an apostle. This is, of course, not a picture of 11-year-old John Willard, but of him as a grown man. Brigham's intent in the secret ordination of John Willard becomes more clear in light of his October 1861 policy change to the rules governing apostolic seniority. 
President Young, at General Conference, announced that apostolic seniority would subsequently be determined by date of ordination and not by age within the group in which new apostles entered the quorum. This had the immediate effect of moving John Taylor ahead of Wilford Woodruff. Quote, President Young directed the clerk, J.T. Long, to place Brother Taylor's name above Brother Woodruff's as Elder Taylor was ordained four or five months before Elder Woodruff. President Young said the calling was made in accordance with the date of ordination. Tellingly, Brigham noted that, quote, he spoke of it now because the time would come when a dispute might arise about it. Here we see that in 1860, the year before Brigham's policy change, Wilford Woodruff ranked ahead of John Taylor in seniority. And that by 1862, the year after the change, John Taylor had moved ahead of Wilford Woodruff in quorum seniority. If not for this change, John Taylor would never have been president of the church as Wilford Woodruff outlived him. Likewise, John Willard Young, with this new policy, would almost certainly become president of the church at some point, barring unforeseen difficulties, apostasy, or death, provided he entered the Quorum of the Twelve. In 1855, at the time of John Willard's ordination when he was 11 years old, the next youngest apostle was Franklin D. Richards, who at the time was 34 years old. In 1864, Brigham Young secretly ordained two more sons as apostles, whose names were Brigham Jr. and Joseph A. Young. Brigham eventually revealed the three secret ordinations to two of the twelve, John Taylor and George A. Smith. He told them, quote, I am going to tell you something that I have never before mentioned to any other person. I have ordained my sons, Joseph A., Brigham, and John W., apostles and my counselors. Have you any objections? John Taylor and George A. Smith said they had, they had not, that it was his own affair, and they considered it under his own direction. He further stated, in ordaining my sons, I have done no more than I am perfectly willing that you should do with yours, and I am now determined to put my sons into active service in the spiritual affairs of the kingdom and keep them there just as long as possible you have the same privilege. So now it becomes known to others that an age-based apostolic arms race has been unleashed by Brigham. Interestingly, George A. Smith's son was called to be an apostle in 1880, and John Taylor's son was called to the Quorum of the Twelve in 1884. Joseph F. Smith, who would be called into the Quorum of the Twelve when he was 28 years old, called his son, Hiram Mack Smith, to be an apostle just a week after he became church president in 1901. Then, nine years later, he called a second son into the first presidency and a third son, Joseph Fielding Smith, to be an apostle, who eventually became church president in 1970. After a prayer meeting with Joseph F. Smith and four apostles, John Taylor, Wilfred Woodruff, George A. Smith, and George Q. Cannon, a group that did not include the most senior apostles, Hyde and Pratt, Young began to take off his temple clothes. Then, as recorded by Wilford Woodruff, said, quote, Of a sudden, he stopped and examined, Hold on, shall I do as I feel led? I always feel well to do as the Spirit constrains me. It is my mind to ordain Brother Joseph F. Smith to the apostleship and to be one of my counselors. He then asked for the feelings of the apostles present, who gave the, the idea hearty approval after which Brother Joseph F. Smith knelt upon the altar and we laid our hands upon him, Brother Brigham being mouth, end quote. Young then ordained Joseph F. Smith an apostle and a counselor to the First Presidency. Brigham counseled the apostles present to make a record of it, but instructed them not to tell anyone else about the event. I've wondered if Brigham was aware that Joseph and Emma's sons, David and Alexander, were on their way to Utah from the east on a proselytizing mission for the reorganized church in the summer of 1866 when he decided to call Joseph F. Smith, who was Hiram Smith's son, as an apostle. To be clear, this is speculative, but because the telegraph had arrived in Utah in 1861, while the railroad would not arrive until 1869, it's possible someone had alerted Brigham to David and Alexander's travel plans prior to their arrival. Brigham understood that Joseph had identified his son David as his successor as church president, and having Hiram's son as his, that is, Brigham's, counselor in the first presidency might relieve any pressure David's arrival in Utah could cause. So the series of events in 1866 went like this. Joseph F. Smith was ordained an apostle in July. David and Alexander Smith arrived in Utah and started preaching in August. And in October, Brigham said this in General Conference. After attempting to discredit the Smith family by claiming that Emma Smith had twice tried to kill Joseph by putting poison in his coffee, Brigham said this, quote, If there are any Latter-day Saints who wish to be destroyed, run after that family, meaning the Smith family, and I will promise you in the name of the God of Israel that you will be damned. 
Young David Smith seems to be the pet of the company, referring to the group of RLDS missionaries that had arrived in Utah. He is heart and hand with his brother Joseph and with a hundred others who are apostates from the true faith of the gospel and who were one with the mob who persecuted and slew the prophet. While Joseph the prophet was killed, his wife Emma was pregnant. Joseph said previous to his death, She shall have a son, and his name shall be called David, and unto him the Lord will look. I am looking for the time when the Lord will speak to David, but let him pursue the course he is now pursuing, and he will never preside over the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in time nor in eternity. He has got to repent of his sins and turn away from his iniquity, to cease to do evil and learn to do well, embrace the gospel of life and salvation, and be an obedient son of God, or he can never walk up to possess his right. It would be his right to preside over this church if he would only walk in the true path of duty. I hope and pray that he and the whole family will repent and be a holy family. Now you old Mormons, stop your talking about young Joseph and about David going to preside over the church by and by. I wish he was prepared for it, would repent of his sins and come in at the door and be one with us and walk up to the twelve in the first presidency saying, I am one with you and am your servant. Anyway, although it's speculative, I don't think it's outside the realm of possibility to think that Brigham may have decided to unilaterally call Joseph F. Smith as an apostle in reaction to the threat that Joseph's sons posed during their visit to Utah in the summer of 1866. Brigham's sudden prompting to call Joseph F. Smith would, years later, ironically, play a direct role in precluding Brigham's sons from the church presidency. In 1867, Apostle Amasa Lyman was excommunicated and expelled from the Quorum of the Twelve for apostasy, leaving a vacancy. Brigham originally desired to put Brigham Young Jr. into the vacancy, but this did not take place. Brigham Jr., writing in his journal, gave an interesting behind-the-scenes view of what happened. At this point, quote, Brother George A. Smith suggested that it might raise a question and comment if Brigham Young Jr. was put in in place of Brother Amasa M. Lyman, apostatized, and if Joseph F. Smith was now put into the quorum, it could make no difference as Brigham Young Jr. was ordained an apostle and would take his place in the quorum according to that ordination. This statement shows that the policy of seniority reckoned entirely by date of ordination to the apostleship was firmly in place at the time. As George A. Smith suggested in his journal entry, Brigham Jr., when he joined the quorum at a later date, quote, would take his place or rank in the quorum according to that earlier apostolic ordination. Interestingly, Brigham Sr. bowed to George A. Smith's counsel, and as a result, Joseph F. Smith would later become president of the church rather than Brigham Jr. However, because the policy of seniority by date of ordination was then accepted, Brigham had no qualms about putting Joseph F. Smith into the Twelve first, since he expected that his sons would always have seniority over Joseph F. Smith. When another vacancy occurred, Brigham Jr. was brought into the Quorum of the Twelve in 1868. Here we see that in 1870, even though Joseph F. Smith had been called into the Quorum of the Twelve a couple of years before Brigham Young Jr., Brigham Jr. was placed ahead of Joseph F. Smith in terms of apostolic seniority because of Brigham's 1861 policy change, reckoning seniority by date of apostolic ordination. By ordination date, John Willard Young would have fallen in between Franklin D. Richards and George Q. Cannon in terms of seniority, but he had not yet been formally called into the Quorum of the Twelve. From 1863 on, although John Willard was technically an apostle and assistant counselor in the First Presidency, he spent much of his time in New York engaged in business ventures. In these, he alternated between dazzling success and inability to fulfill his dreams and promises. One day he would be a millionaire, and he liked to live like a millionaire. The next he would be penniless. He quickly became chronically indebted and beset by creditors. He raised money with a golden tongue, but when his projects failed, many contributors felt betrayed. Brigham knew that John Willard was deeply in debt. Brigham Young Jr., visiting John Willard at one time, wrote, quote, I have passed a miserable day seeing John harassed by duns. Money could not hire me to endure the torture which my poor brother suffers every day. I know it must be terrible on his mind, end quote. Brigham Sr. would often plead with John Willard to come back to Utah to take up his responsibilities in church leadership, but John Willard never seemed uh, single-mindedly interested in church affairs. In April 1873, John Willard, along with four others, was publicly sustained as an assistant counselor to Brigham. Still, John W. did not seem to fulfill his church obligations in any substantial way. Brigham went to the length of paying many of John Willard's debts to convince him to come back to Utah. 
But after a stay in Utah, John Willard once again returned to the East. Toward the end of Brigham's life, he managed to bring John Willard back to church service once again. In February and March 1876, John Willard visited Utah. On the day before his departure, Brigham told his son that he desired to make him his first counsel in the First Presidency if he would walk up to his duties. Evidently, Brigham Young once again coaxed him to accept by offering financial assistance, and John Willard agreed to accept the high church position. After arranging his business affairs in the East, John Willard returned to Utah in October 1876 and became first counselor. This youthful apostle, now only 32 years old, had a church position of high visibility. He had avoided church service throughout his life, but now he held the second most important position in the entire church. In September 1874, Brigham became quote-unquote gravely ill for the first time in 20 years because of an enlarged prostate gland. Possibly concerned that his life might not last a lot longer, Brigham demoted the two senior-most apostles next in line for church presidency, Orson Hyde and Orson Pratt. Brigham openly disliked Elder Orson Hyde. Wilfred Woodruff recorded that in October of 1856, Young publicly chastised Hyde, saying that he, quote, ought to be cut off from the Quorum of the Twelve and the Church. He is no more fit to stand at the head of the Quorum of the Twelve than a dog. His soul is entirely occupied with a few dimes, and it is much more in his eyes than God, heaven, and eternal life. He is a stink in my nostrils. Regarding Orson Pratt's demotion, Apostle Moses Thatcher's explanation was blunt. Brigham Young, quote, was prejudiced against Orson Pratt. Orson Pratt's opposition to several of Brigham's doctrinal innovations, some of which have been covered in this presentation, likely contributed to Brigham's feelings. Brigham's first counselor, George A. Smith, had a son named John Henry Smith, who would later become an apostle. Apostle John Henry Smith reported in 1893 that he was present once when the question of moving Brother Hyde and Orson Pratt back in the quorum came up between his father and Brigham Young. He remembered his father, George A. Smith, telling Brigham Young, quote, I have always counseled against making this change, hoping that Brother Hyde might die and thus be spared that humiliation. But seeing how sick you have been for some time, I feared the consequences if you should have died. I shall no longer oppose the move. This is the way apostolic seniority looked in 1874, with Orson Hyde as the president of the Quorum of the Twelve, followed by Orson Pratt, then John Taylor, and Wilford Woodruff. Brigham's 1875 change brought John Taylor and Wilford Woodruff to the top of the quorum, demoting Orson Hyde and Orson Pratt to third and fourth in seniority. So fast forward two years, and in 1876, the year after Brigham's change, John Taylor is now three spots in front of Orson Pratt, rather than being behind him in seniority. If Brigham hadn't made that change just two years before he died, John Taylor would not have been the third president of the church. It appears that Brigham did this not because he wanted John Taylor to become the next president. In fact, we know Brigham did not want that to happen, but because Brigham was even more opposed to Orson Pratt becoming the next church president. In Brigham's old age and sickness, he had a different priority on his mind, his favorite son, John Willard Young. So like we covered before, 1876 was the year Brigham's plan to set up his son John Willard to run the church moved into high gear. After deciding to call John Willard as the first counsel in the first presidency, Brigham brought the matter before the Twelve to enlist their support. Joseph F. Smith, one of Brigham's counselors, quote, stated that he thought the people would very much prefer to see Brigham Jr. selected rather than to take John W. to fill that position. President Young turned to Joseph F. and shaking his finger at him said, I have got Brigham Jr. and I have got you and I want John W. Brigham, who did not look kindly upon opposition, immediately instructed Joseph F. Smith to prepare to go on a five-year European mission. Joseph F. went to Europe, but was recalled back to Salt Lake soon after Brigham died. This was not the first time Brigham sent an apostle who opposed him away from Utah. In 1848, Elder Orson Pratt was sent to England, where he presided over the European mission. In 1852, Pratt was sent to Washington, D.C. to publish a pro-polygamy newspaper. In 1856, Pratt was sent to preside over the church in Britain. In 1860, Pratt was called to the eastern United States. In 1861, Pratt moved to southern Utah to oversee development of the church-sponsored uh, church cotton industry. And in 1864, Pratt was sent to preside over the church's central European mission. You get the picture. In contrast, after Brigham Young returned to Utah in the spring of 1848, he never left it again. 
In 1876, Brigham's son, John Willard Young, the same one Brigham ordained to be an apostle when he was 11 years old, was publicly sustained as first counselor in the first presidency, even though he had never been called and sustained as a member of the Quorum of the Twelve. Daniel H. Wells, Brigham's second counselor in the first presidency, had been, had been ordained an apostle but never called into the Quorum of the Twelve either. Brigham's other five counselors in the first presidency had all previously been publicly sustained as members of the Quorum of the Twelve. Brigham's plan to set up his sons to run the church was now in place. John Willard Young, who had become the first counselor in the First Presidency at 32 years old, would outlive all other members of the First Presidency and 12 alive at the time he was sustained, and his brother, Brigham Young Jr., would outlive all others except Joseph F. Smith, who was situated below both Young brothers in terms of quorum hierarchy based on their ordination dates. Brigham's plan for his sons to control the church after his death was in place but not even Brigham could control the fate of his heirs apparent after he passed away. In the years after Brigham died, several new apostles, Moses Thatcher, Francis Lyman, John Henry Smith, George Teasdale, and Heber J. Grant, were called into the quorum, but John Willard Young was not one of them. In addition, apostolic financial compensation was adjusted after Brigham died. Joseph F. Smith, commenting on the newly limited compensation for apostles, wrote, quote, one man, probably John Willard Young, for instance, who has drawn $16,000 per year from the tithing office for his support, has been cut down to $2,000 per year. Thus, some of the leaks are plugged up, and we hope to be able by and by to build the temple. That means John Willard had been taking the equivalent of over $400,000 a year in 2021 dollars, while his father was alive and was now being reduced to the equivalent of $50,000 a year. President Taylor did not look as kindly upon John Willard as Brigham had. Apostle George Q. Cannon, who had been a special counselor and private secretary to Brigham Young, commented that fellow apostles, quote, felt that the funds of the church had been used with a freedom not warranted by the authority which he, meaning Brigham, held. So after Brigham died in 1877, John Taylor led the church as president of the Quorum of the Twelve for three years. The three-year delay seems to have been due mostly to the apostles' resentment for how little Brigham had consulted with them when he led the church, and they were hesitant to approve a new first presidency that might treat them the same way. As Heber J. Grant would later describe, Brigham, quote, had not counseled as much with the counsel of the apostles as, as with those persons with whom he was surrounded. The delay may also have been influenced by Brigham's dislike for John Taylor, as evidenced by the fact that Brigham never sustained John Taylor as president of the Quorum of the Twelve, publicly or privately, and didn't want Elder Taylor to become the president of the church after him, which was revealed by Daniel H. Wells, Brigham's counsel in the First Presidency, in a meeting of the apostles four days after Brigham died. One reason Brigham didn't like Elder Taylor may have been because in 1872, Apostle John Taylor told General Conference, quote, And if we have presidents or apostles or anybody that we do not like, let us vote them out and be free men. Did Brigham feel targeted or threatened by Elder Taylor's remarks? Two days later, still during conference, Brigham Young and his counselors were each sustained as prophet, seer, and revelator. This is notable because it was the first conference since 1859, or in 13 years, in which any church leader was sustained with that title. The Quorum of the Twelve Apostles were not presented for vote as prophets, seers, and revelators at the conference, and from the next conference in April of 1873 until his death, Brigham was the only church officer sustained in conference as prophet, seer, and revelator. As we mentioned previously, in April 1875, Brigham demoted Orson Hyde and Orson Pratt to beneath John Taylor for the first time in nearly 37 years. This action also released Hyde as president of the Quorum of the Twelve, which he'd been sustained as publicly since 1847. However, because of their mutual dislike, Young declined to sustain Taylor in Hyde's former office as president of the Quorum of the Twelve, either privately or publicly, throughout the remainder of his life. Only months before Brigham would die, at a meeting in St. George, Utah, Brigham Young verbally excoriated second-ranked Apostle John Taylor for his indifference to Brigham's communitarian united orders. Young warned that Taylor could lose his standing in the Twelve and he canceled his administrative assignments, quote, It looked for a time as though these two great men would separate in anger, remembered Lorenzo Snow. Young prohibited Taylor from actively functioning in his apostolic office, sarcastically instructing him to, quote, return home and make wagons until he knew what was right, end quote. 
Snow finally convinced Taylor to apologize, which Snow believed was necessary to preserve Taylor's status in the Twelve. The two apostles were coolly received at Young's house, but as soon as Taylor confessed, quote, Brother Brigham, if I have done or said anything wrong, I desire to make it right, the anger disappeared and they were reconciled. On the 29th of August, 1877, Brigham died, and just over a month later, in October of 1877, for the first time, John Taylor was sustained in conference as the president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, an office not presented for vote since the release of Orson Hyde a few years before. The conference also sustained the Twelve as prophets, seers, and revelators for the first time in 41 years. In 1880, the Apostles finally agreed to form a new First Presidency, and, as mentioned previously, John Willard Young was not called into the quorum, although a vacancy arose. In 1881, John Willard was tried by the Quorum of the Twelve for his conduct, but was ultimately reconciled. This happened again in 1883, 1884, and 1885. With the senior brethren still concerned about what to do with John Willard Young, the Apostle, in 1900, President Lorenzo Snow, with the support of his first presidency counselor, Joseph F. Smith, overturned Brigham's policy that reckoned apostolic seniority by date of ordination to instead determine seniority by date of entrance into the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. This change moved Joseph F. Smith ahead of Brigham Jr. as the senior most apostle, so that when Lorenzo Snow died the following year, Joseph F. Smith and not Brigham Jr. became the next church president. As Brigham Jr. would not outlive Joseph F. Smith, this change ended his chances of ever becoming church president, and it completely removed John Willard Young from contention for the presidency. In 1901, when Lorenzo Snow died and Joseph F. Smith became the next church president, it also definitively rendered inert the threat of other apostles secretly ordaining their sons to the apostleship in the future. So, of the seven major doctrinal and structural changes Brigham made during his presidency, which we've now covered in this or other videos, only one survives today. It is that the Twelve Apostles were never supposed to preside over organized stakes, but only over the mission field where no stakes had yet been organized. Brigham made this change four months after Joseph died. This last remaining major innovation continues to have significant ongoing impact on the Church, and yet seems unlikely to be reversed. When the Church was originally organized, the Quorum of the Twelve didn't exist. It wasn't considered necessary to the organizational structure when the Church was originally founded in 1830. Five years later, when Joseph did eventually ask the three witnesses of the Book of Mormon to call and ordain Twelve Apostles, Joseph specifically limited their role to doing missionary work and supervising Church activity outside the borders of organized stakes. The Twelve were never supposed to be involved in the affairs of an existing stake. We can see this in Doctrine and Covenants section 107, which was revealed in 1835, about the same time the Twelve Apostles were sent out for the first time as missionaries. The word that seems to most consistently characterize the intended role of the Twelve Apostles is, interestingly, traveling. They were supposed to be out in the world or in the mission field, away from the Church's established stakes and population centers. In verse 23 of section 107, they're called the Twelve Traveling Counselors. In verse 33, they're the Traveling Presiding High Council. In verse 34, they're the Traveling High Council. In verse 35, we read that the Twelve are sent out, quote, first unto the Gentiles and then unto the Jews. And in verses 36 and 38, they're referred to again as the Traveling High Council. The Twelve's authority and role was intended to be in the mission field, away from established stakes, where they would supervise the Seventy doing missionary work and preside over small branches that were not yet large enough to become stakes. The keys the Twelve received were not to govern members in organized stakes, but specifically, quote, the Twelve being sent out, holding the keys to open the door by the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The role of the Twelve was to conduct and supervise missionary work. This is similar to what the history of the Church records was taught a few months earlier, quote, they are to hold the keys of this ministry, to unlock the door of the kingdom of heaven unto all nations, and to preach the gospel to every creature. This is the power, authority, and virtue of their apostleship. And perhaps in greatest contrast to what we see today, stake high councils were equal in authority in the affairs of the church with the first presidency and the quorum of the twelve. Quote, the standing high councils at the stakes of Zion form a quorum equal in authority in the affairs of the church in all their decisions to the quorum of the presidency or to the traveling high council. 
During the same time frame that DNC Section 107 was released, Joseph taught the following, which was later published in the Millennial Star, quote, President Joseph Smith then stated that the Twelve will have no right to go into Zion or any of its stakes and there undertake to regulate the affairs thereof, where there is a standing high council. But it is their duty to go abroad and regulate all matters relative to the different branches of the church. This is why branches reported to mission presidents, then to 70s, then to the apostles, rather than to the closest stake president. The same prohibition to keep apostles from trying to preside over stakes protected the apostles' designated area of responsibility from encroachment by ambitious stake leaders. Quote, no standing high council has authority to go into the churches abroad and regulate the matters thereof, for this belongs to the twelve. No standing high council will ever be established only in Zion or one of its stakes. As this is not at all how the church functions today, we ought to ask how this significant change came to be. The four types of councils outlined in DNC 107, the First Presidency, the Quorum of the Twelve, the Seventy, and the Stake High Councils, are all equal in authority and power. It's also in Section 107 that we find the requirement for unanimity for these councils to make decisions, quote, and every decision made by these quorums must be by the unanimous voice of the same. That is, every member in each quorum must be agreed to its decisions in order to make their decision of the same power or validity one with the other. The Twelve are to officiate under the direction of the First Presidency, and the Seventy are to officiate under the direction of the Twelve. But the idea that the Twelve should or even could select a new First Presidency isn't introduced or even hinted at in DNC 107. Most significantly, there was a firewall put in place by the Prophet Joseph between the Stake High Councils and the Twelve and Seventy. The Twelve and Seventy had authority only in the mission field and branches, not in the Stakes of Zion. Brigham completely ignored Joseph's instruction that the Twelve have no right to go into stakes and undertake to regulate the affairs thereof by, just four months after Joseph's death, releasing the stake president in Nauvoo and calling most of the elders that were under stake leadership to be seventies who were under the direction of the Twelve, and ultimately to Brigham as the president of the Quorum of the Twelve. Brigham called others, including members of the Nauvoo High Council and members of Ward Bishoprics in Nauvoo, to move out of Nauvoo with their families and become branch presidents in faraway locations where they would also be under the direction of the apostles rather than under the direction of the Nauvoo stake leadership as they had been while Joseph was alive. By Joseph's explicit instructions, Brigham didn't have the right to do any of this. By the time the saints began leaving Nauvoo for Utah, Brigham had created 35 new quorums of 70 to hold all the priesthood holders he misappropriated from the Nauvoo stake. This brazen power grab and clear subversion of Joseph's original structure and intent has become so much a part of our modern church construct that it can be difficult to imagine how the church would operate in the decentralized manner Joseph intended. The announcement read, the presidents of 70s will organize all the 70s. We want to select a number of high priests to go through the states to preside over congressional districts. Then we want to have the elders quorum organized that we can take out of the elders quorum and fill up the 70s. We want all the 70s to be here and their presidents. We want them organized and begin to fill up the second quorum and then the third and the fourth to the tenth. The business of the day will be to ordain presidents of the 70s and then fill the quorums of 70s from the elders quorum and select men from the quorums of high priests to go abroad and preside. Elder G.A. Smith moved that all in the elders quorum under the age of 35 should be ordained into the 70s if they are in good standing and worthy and will accept it. The motion was seconded and carried unanimously. Previous to adjournment, the presidents of the 70s ordained upwards of 400 into the quorums of 70s, and the presidents of the high priest quorum ordained 40 into their quorum. This mass ordination of Nauvoo's males to the office of 70 removed them from the jurisdiction of the stake high council. These newly ordained 70s were under the exclusive jurisdiction of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles in accordance with DNC 107. By the time of the exodus from Nauvoo, Brigham had filled 35 quorums of 70. This accounted for most of the males who received the endowment in the Nauvoo Temple, transferring nearly 2,500 men from the jurisdiction of the Stake High Council. This was the way in which Brigham overwhelmed by sheer numbers the revealed equality of authority which the High Council at Nauvoo shared with the Quorum of Twelve Apostles. When it mentions selecting men from the Quorums of High Priests to go abroad, it included members of the Nauvoo Stake High Council. 
Brigham sent them outside of the Nauvoo stake into the mission field to preside over con congressional districts where they would be under the control of the apostles. As we read here, President B. Young then appeared and proceeded to select men from the high priest quorum to go abroad in all the congressional districts of the United States to preside over the branches of the church as follows. President Young explained the object for which these high priests were being sent out and informed them that it was not the design to go and tarry six months and then return, but to go and settle down where they can take their families and tarry until the temple is built and then come and get their endowments and return to their families and build up a stake as large as this. Brigham simply dismantled the structure and controls Joseph had set up so that he could be in charge. This went directly against what Joseph had stipulated about the Twelve not having any authority to, quote, go into Zion or any of its stakes and there undertake to regulate the affairs thereof, where there is a standing high council. Those that threatened Brigham's power grab were released, excommunicated, and or intimidated into leaving town. And that's how Brigham and the apostles took control of the church in direct opposition to what Joseph had established. The threat of violence against those that opposed Brigham was real. On the 22nd of February, 1845, Hosea Stout discussed with other church leaders, quote, the manner to pursue to rid ourselves of traitors who are in our midst seeking our lives. Five days later, William Clayton wrote, during the evening, some person or persons took Washington Peck a man whose father was bishop of the Nauvoo 10th Ward, and bedobbed him all over with privy dirt from an outhouse. Clayton added, This is one of those mean traitors who lurks about continually in our midst, communicating with our enemies and seeking to have the Twelve destroyed. He is marked as a mean conspirator. Hosea's brother, Alan Stout, was patrolling as a policeman in the vicinity of this assault, which threw William Marks, whom Brigham had released as president of the Nauvoo High Council just months before into a rage that alienated him forever from Brigham Young. Unsurprisingly, after the fecal attack on Washington Peck, the ex-president of Nauvoo Stakes suddenly left the city. Marx spared himself the repressive tactics which the Twelve and their supporters were using against suspected dissenters. On the 16th of March, Brigham dryly observed that Brother William Marks has gone without being whittled out. By whittled out, Brigham was referring to what became known as the Nauvoo Whistling and Whittling Brigade, described in this article in the Friend magazine in April 1983. An excerpt from the fictionalized story reads, Boys, Brother Johnson began, we need your help. Ever since the mobbers in Carthage killed the prophet Joseph Smith and his brother Hiram, they've been trying to force the saints to move out of Nauvoo. Now they've repealed the city charter, and we don't even have any police to protect us from these ruffians. We need a little more time to get ready before we can leave, and you boys can help give us that time. We'll be glad to help, Oliver said. What can we do? Just walk around town, whistling and whittling, Brother Johnson answered. We already do that, Will Baines said. Exactly, Brother Johnson said. It doesn't seem like anything out of the ordinary. Whistling is a happy sound, and whittling is a harmless pastime. Who could object to that? One boy then asked, what if they don't like it? To which Brother Johnson answered, what can they do? You're too little to pick on and too many to lick. The reality seems to have been quite different. Armed with knives from 10 to 14 inches long, a dozen young men and adults of the Whistling and Whittling Brigade pressed close to a dissenter or suspicious non-Mormon, and their incessant whistling with those large knives was enough to strike terror to the hearts of the victims, and he got out of town as quick as his legs could carry him. Of these whittlers, Young observed that at the corner of every block a deacon is found attending to his duty, and every part of the city is watched with the strictest care. Although romanticized as young boys who bluffed away adults, these whittlers were hardly boys, and their actions were sometimes violent. In 1845, Priesthood rolls show that the youngest member of Nauvoo's Aaronic priesthood was 17 and the oldest was 53. One witness saw a Nauvoo dissenter, quote, going out of town, whittled by about 20 men with long bowie knives, kicking him down and pushing him in the mud, etc., for three quarters of a mile. On April 3rd, Hosea Stout recorded that Brigham Young commanded the Nauvoo police for beating, quote, a man almost to death in the temple. At a meeting of the high priests of Nauvoo's Fifth Ward the next day, Bishops Edward Hunter, Benjamin Covey, and presiding Elder Duncan MacArthur 
all agreed that if certain Mormons did not reform, quote, they would at once discover themselves in the hands of Aunt Peggy, meaning having feces smeared on them, and take leave of absence. Three days after that warning, Brigham was sustained in the April 1845 General Conference, quote, as the president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles to this church and nation and all nations, and also as the president of the whole church of Latter-day Saints, end quote. The apostles omitted these words from the published minutes of the conference so that only Nauvoo Mormons knew that Young had been sustained as church president. As was often the case, those who depended on the church newspaper had little knowledge of Mormonism's most important developments. William Smith, who was called to be one of the original Twelve Apostles, as was Brigham, explained, quote, I opposed also the whittling, whistling, and beastly anointing practiced upon strangers and driving away from Nauvoo the doctors and lawyers. Again and again it was repeated on the stand by Kimball, Young, Taylor, and others, that lawyers must leave, for it was then a time of peace, and that if they did not, they should be offered as a sacrifice of smoking meat. That is, for the doctors, they were all a perfect nuisance. To all these elevated and charitable thoughts and expressions, the congregation responded, Amen. All this was entirely repugnant to my feelings, and I could not avoid manifesting my dissent. The consequence was that I was informed I had better look out, or I should be cut off from the church. The environment of intimidation targeting anybody willing or capable of criticizing the brethren was effective. A couple of months later, a man was brutally beaten 50 yards from Brigham Young's house, which at the time was being protected by several men from Brigham's personal police force who admitted hearing the attack and the victim's cries for help, but apparently didn't respond. Stabbed four times and left with serious head injuries from blunt objects, the victim, Irvin Hodges struggled to Brigham's house where he, according to the policeman, identified his attacker as a friend whom he declined to name. The police also claimed he requested a priesthood blessing from Brigham before passing away. The police claimed they did not see an attacker. The police indifference or possibly complicity was a concern to William, who had been warned to arrange for his own bodyguards to avoid the same fate befalling him. William wrote a letter to Brigham complaining he didn't trust the police, and in response, William was invited by John Taylor to discuss the matter. When William showed up on the third floor of the Masonic Hall for the meeting with Brigham, William expected to see other apostles or maybe some of the Nauvoo bishops. Instead, he found himself surrounded by 50 to 60 armed policemen armed with bowie knives, pistols, and hickory clubs blocking his exit. William stated his concerns, to which Brigham responded, quote, I will let William Smith know that he has no right to counsel this church, for I am the man. I will let William Smith know also that he shall not counsel the police. And I will let William Smith know that I am the president and head of this church. And strange to say, all the police and the bishops and the twelve who were present said thereunto, Amen. The conclusion I drew from all this, that it was an intentional hint to me that I had better leave. Not long thereafter, William was dropped from the quorum and then excommunicated. Hosea Stout's diary describes several occasions when Brigham Young and the Apostles seriously described having Hosea rid ourselves of various church members considered dangerous to the church and the Apostles. When the Salt Lake Municipal High Council tried Hosea Stout for attempted murder, he protested that, quote, it has been my duty to hunt out the rotten spots in the kingdom. He added that he had tried not to handle a man's case until it was right. Stout's diary also describes several occasions when Brigham Young and the Apostles seriously discussed having Hosea, quote, rid ourselves, unquote, of various church members considered dangerous to the church and the Apostles. Stout referred to this as cut him off behind the ears according to the law of God in such cases. A couple of weeks after Joseph and Hiram died, William Clayton wrote in his journal, Quote, Joseph has said that if he and Hiram were taken away, Samuel H. Smith would be his successor. Samuel was Joseph's younger brother, the third person baptized into the church after Oliver Cowdery and Joseph Smith, and was one of the eight witnesses to the Book of Mormon. Clayton's diary also confirms the efforts of Apostle Willard Richards to avoid the appointment of a successor before his first cousin, Brigham Young, arrived back in Nauvoo. 
Within days, Samuel became violently ill. By July 24th, he was, according to the history of the church, very sick, and on July 30th, he died. Church member John Bernheisel, who had been Joseph's personal physician and delivered some of Joseph and Emma's children, concluded that Samuel had been poisoned by non-Mormons. Samuel's daughter also believed her father had been poisoned, but not by non-Mormons. She wrote, quote, My father was undoubtedly poisoned. Uncle Arthur Milliken was poisoned at the same time. The same doctors were treating my father and Uncle Arthur at the same time. Uncle Arthur discontinued the medicine without letting them know that he was doing so. Aunt Lucy threw it in the fire. Father, meaning Samuel Smith, continued taking it until the last dose. He spit out and said he was poisoned, but it was too late. He died. That quote came from a letter she wrote in 1908. William Smith, Joseph's brother that was an apostle in good standing when Joseph and Hiram died, learned from Samuel's widow that Hosea Stout had acted as his brother's nurse. Stout had given him white powder medicine daily until his death. Given the severity of the possible implications, we have to ask ourselves, was Hosea Stout really capable of killing another member of the church in good standing? William Clayton thought he was. In 1847, William Clayton asked Brigham to be allowed to be in the first company of saints departing for Utah because Hosea Stout had told Clayton he was going to murder him once the apostles left. Clayton did not record any attempt by Young to dispute Clayton's assessment of Stout. While these troubling allegations cannot be verified, they also should not be ignored. Brigham Young had a significant effect on the church that Joseph founded. From the Temple Oath of Vengeance, to the Black Priesthood Ban, to Adam God Doctrine, to Plural Marriage, to Blood Atonement, to altering the reckoning of apostolic seniority, and finally to apostles presiding where they were never authorized to, we have almost recovered from all his doctrinal and structural innovations. It seems likely that it will be up to us as individual members to recognize the proper role of the apostles in the church and adjust our own understanding and worship accordingly, rather than waiting for the church to fix Brigham's last remaining unauthorized innovation.